as you all know, the Lord had laid in our hearts towards the beginning of the year to lay the foundation again. And now this is one year. We are almost at the middle of the foundation. And uh, as I say, in church, the church is not for someone to propagate his ideas, even if he claims to have received it from the Lord. The blueprint of a true church is laid in the Bible, in the New Testament. And you cannot do anything else except what is laid there. Hence, Paul said, for no other foundation can be laid than that which is laid. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The material for the foundation is in the Bible. The material for building is in the Bible. The power to build is from the Lord. The power for the foundation is from the Lord. If any of them come from any other source, it's not more God. Even if God started, if someone takes over, God withdraws. Praise the Lord. I want us now, based on all that we've studied, enter into question and answer session. Amen. I want to know the difference between uh, repentance and uh, redemption. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Repentance and redemption. Now, let me give you a picture first. Imagine that you are a child and your father wants you not to pass through this door. And you say, ah, why is daddy always saying I shouldn't pass through this door? You open the door and you want to jump out and you realize there's a deep hole there and you fall into the hole, you cannot come out. When you are in that hole, you cry to the father and you tell the father, Father, I am sorry for what I did by disobeying your word. I'm now in this darkness, in this hole. There's no way for me to come out. You don't even know that he will help you bring you out. You are there. And there's no possibility of you ever coming out. And right there, you tell yourself, why in this hole, I will decide now not to disobey my father anymore. Now your new place is in that hole with snakes and frogs in that hole. There's a man in Zimbabwe, he went to clean a well. And as he jumped into the, the, the well, he found snakes in the well. The snakes beat him to death. He died there and the snakes were there and every other person was afraid to go down to that place and remove his cups. So they left him there for a number of weeks because they couldn't go inside. Do you know the picture I'm giving you, those snakes are demons. That man was on land with human beings. Then he went inside that hole to do some work there. Then he went there and made snakes. And the snakes conquered him. Like when you turn away from God, the devil conquered you and changed you and changed your nature and held your hand to lead you to another direction. Now you are in that hole with snakes, with demons. Your family members are demonic. Your tradition, the Bible says, is empty. Demonic also. Because it comes from Adam and Eve. And you are in all of this. While you are there, you tell yourself, going forward, although I have done this mess, can everybody listen? Although I have done this mess with my life, and there's no hope for me, what I decide from now is that I will never go my own way anymore, even in this hole. I will go contrary to the snakes, though I live with them. When the snake says that I should crawl like them, I'll say no. But I'm inside the hole with them. That is repentance. 
Repentance is refusing to behave like the snake. Repentance is refusing to follow others from the snake and their kingdom. Imagine that hole, the snakes that are there. Their king is there. Lucifer, the dragon. He gives instruction and the snakes follow it and they instruct you, do like this. Go and rape this person. Go and kill. Go and steal. Go and tell a lie. And you obey. The day you say, though I'm in this hole with the snakes, Jesus says they are in the world but not of the world. I will repent. I will oppose the snakes. Then they start to hammer you, persecute you there in the hole. Did you get that? The snakes persecute you because you are in their territory. You are in their camp. They persecute you. You say, whatever persecution you give me, I will not obey you. I might have no hope because I disobey God and I'm not in this hole. But I will not obey you, Father. You have repented. Redemption is when God stretches his hands and takes you out of that hole. When God, now while you were in that hole, some of the rats might have eaten your toes and cut them off. Redemption is when God restores those toes. I'm speaking spiritually. When God restores those toes. Because the devil has taken a lot from us. Redemption is God regenerating us. If any man is in Christ, he's still in the world. But not of the world, but he's a new creation. That is why, now if you are in that hole and you say, ah, there's no hope for me. I'm in the world. Let me do like the worldly people do. What is my own? And you start to obey the snake so that they should not bite you. God also will leave you there because he sees that you are comfortable. Why should God come and take you from the snakes that you like? Why should God take you away from demons? When you like them. When demons of sexual immorality come, you obey them. Why do you want God to redeem you? So he leaves you with them. But the day you start to oppose them, you have repented. That's why one of the first mark of true repentance is persecution from those with whom you used to walk before. Praise the Lord. Have you understood the picture? The Holy Spirit will give you more from the Bible. Some manuscripts, that verse says, redemption through the forgiveness of sins. Let me check what King James Version says. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Now, King James Version is complete. Thank God for King James. Praise the Lord. Amen. Boy is vindicated. Praise Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Have you seen that? Other versions do not put his blood. But King James says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Brother, let me explain again the process of redemption. When you sin by going to the place where the father said you should not go and you went there. First, the body that you took to go there is not your body. Usually we say, this is my body. I can do with, with it what I like. No. God made your body and gave it to you. And you are the soul. You took that body that God gave to you and went into the hole with it. So you sinned against God primarily while you are in the hole. That is why when you repent, you are saying, Lord, I will not do it again. I will not take this body to do things. Even if I'm among the snakes, I will not use this body to do what the snakes want me to do. That's repentance. But for God to remove you from there, a price has to be paid. He needs to get back what you have spoiled. When you take somebody's thing and they take you to court, you pay it back. After you pay it back, they also charge you for damages, the hurt that you've caused the person. You see, when you commit a sin, when you steal, there are two kinds of evil you've done. The evil is that you've taken somebody's thing. The second evil is that you have done personal damage to somebody also. 
Now the, Jesus paid for that damage you did to God by using the body that he gave you wrongly. When you repent, it is because of the blood of Jesus that the Father forgives you. And when the Father forgives you, he cannot stretch his hands and restore you. That is why he has a plan to take us out of this hole of this world that we find ourselves in today in Jesus' name. Brother, God bless you for that passage. What happened to, to, to faith? Once someone sinned and he repented. I don't know if... Uh, what happened to, to faith? faith? To your faith? Yeah. Once someone sinned and he repented. Now, when believers don't sin, the Bible says anyone that born of God does not sin or continue in sin or abide in sin. Listen, please. When you are a believer, if you are sitting here in church and you are still willing to go and sin, and you leave from here, you make a plan, you take your two legs, and you go and look for where sin is, you commit it. Forget, you are not a believer. You are an agent of the devil. Because a true believer does not plan to sin. That is why if you say you are my brother in Christ, then you left from Pretoria, took a taxi, went to Johannesburg, met a woman there, slept with that woman, and live with that woman. Flew to another place. It's not a mistake. You are not a believer. You practice sin. It's different from another brother who was sitting in his house and this woman just comes in and is asking for help with bad motives. Do you see the difference? Believers don't plan to sin. They don't put structures in place and design and then sin. But they may fall into sin. They may be tempted and they resist. They don't cooperate with the devil to say, oh, yes, Satan, you want me to go and do this? All right, you want me to tell a lie here. Okay, when I shall meet him next month, I will say this kind of lie and this other kind of lie and this other kind of lie. When we put it together, it will give a perfect picture. That is you. Therefore, you are not born again. But if you find yourself in a sudden situation where you slip off and you quickly realize yourself, that is why whenever believers fall, they cry to God. That's a mark that God is still with them. Their heart cry to God. Did you get the difference? And so all be true believers have faith. And even when they fall, it is the faith that makes them to call upon God again back quickly. The picture I gave is when this my brother behind there is an unbeliever. He knows what God wants him to do, but he takes steps to do his own thing. And by the way, there are believers like that too who become rebellious. When you become rebellious and you move out of God, God also moves out of you. Have you read the verse that says, if we deny him, what will he do? Praise the Lord. He will also deny us. Do you know that? How do we deny him? By turning to do our own things. So when a believer knowingly goes ahead and plans sin, and commits sin, and practices sin, that believer has fallen totally. Amen. And if you are in this church, you plan sin. You sin. You practice it. And each day you dream about how you will sin next time. Forget you are not a believer. You are one of those that the Holy Spirit spoke about here. That you are in our midst, but you are an outsider. Praise the Lord. I'm not talking to you, brother Devin. Praise Jesus. Amen. I'm only giving an explanation. Hallelujah. So, but if you get tempted and mistakenly fall, or for example, 
while I'm talking with you, I can mistakenly speak a word that I wasn't supposed to speak. Amen? It's not that I plan that when I meet you, I will give you some words that will pierce you. There are people like that. They sit and they plan. When I meet him, the things I will tell him, I will make sure that when I speak to him, his heart is pierced inside. I destroy him with my words. That is not a believer. Such a person is not a child of God. But I can meet you and you do something and I slip off and say a word that is not good. When the Holy Spirit shows me that this word you speak is not, you spoke is not good, I become remorseful and humble myself and say, please forgive me for that. Then I'm still in the faith. My faith is not taken away. Do you see the difference? So when you, are, when you rebel against God by doing the things that you want to do in sin, you lose your faith. That's when you lose the true faith. The Bible says that they did not want to embrace the love of the truth in order to be saved. Therefore, God gave them over. When God says, this is the way of the truth, do like this, and you say, no, I want to do like this, God gives you over, and the true faith is taken from you. Did you get that, everybody? Amen. That is how many Christians get to some levels where they lose their faith. They lose their faith because they want to continue to follow the things of their own desire, contrary to the word of God. And then God says, all right, since you want to go that way, I take my faith from you. As you continue to take steps in that direction, you realize that increasingly, believing God genuinely becomes difficult. When you want to pray, it's as if you are joking. Is there anybody in this church like that? I want to tell you that if you get to that level, it is because... You stubbornly wanted to go your own way and did not want Jesus to lead you. So he took his Holy Spirit from you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Could uh, it be what uh, James is saying in uh, James 1 from verse 13 to verse uh, uh, 15? James. Verse 1. Uh, James uh, chapter 1, verse 13 to verse 15. Let's open to James chapter 1. Yeah. 13 to 15, let me read. From American Standard Version, New American Standard Version. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Yes, it's partly that. You are tempted when you are carried away. Do you get that? Let me read from King James Version. Verse 14. Every, every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Listen carefully. Listen to the pro process. First, you are drawn away. Did you get that? That is, there's something inside you that wants to do some, commit some sin. And while you are battling inwardly, you get drawn away towards that sin, the source of that sin. Let's take the case of sexual immorality. There may be something inside you that wants to associate with a harlot somewhere, a girl somewhere. And you get tempted. As you yield and you keep meditating on that temptation, you get to a level where you now get drawn towards where that girl is. And in that girl, there's also a corresponding desire in the world. Let's say that girl is the world. When you get close to that girl, what is in you and what is in that girl entices you now. What does it mean to entice? To put a proper structure in place to trap you. Did you get that? Amen? But you will realize that at some point you started cooperating before it gets to enticement. Because later on there, the Bible will explain to us, let's, let's read verse 15. It says, Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, 
it brings forth death. When lust has conceived, when you keep meditating on sinful things, please listen. When you keep meditating on sinful ideas, sinful things all the time, you don't break the root of sin in your life. You meditate on lust. You meditate on women's faces. When you keep meditating like that, one day, that lust will become pregnant. When you get to that stage, you will commit sin. And when you commit sin, sin does not end there. Sin wants you to continue to grow in sin. And there's a level when you reach and God says that Christ will not die the second time for you. He withdraws and he says, you have chosen the way of hell, go to hell. That is when it leads to death. Did you see the process of sin? But it's not a process that happens overnight. So God does not give on, off on his own quickly. He's a long-suffering God. Praise the Lord. And what's the difference between faith and belief? Belief is part of faith. Amen. Amen. Now please. In the Bible, when the Bible says belief, the Bible means faith. Amen. However, our understanding of the word belief is lighter and weaker than what the Bible means when it says belief. Hence, the Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Amen. Let me give you an example. Jesus used pictures in teaching. I also like to use pictures in teaching. Now, sister, what subject did you study in school? So that I take example that you can understand. Sorry? Business. Business. Okay. I don't have an example there. I wanted to take an example from chemistry. Or let me, yeah. When you go to school, you study chemistry. In your elementary chemistry class, do you remember one thing that they, they taught you that you can mix and another thing happens? What is it? Salt. You know salt. Sodom plus chlorine equals to salt. Sodom chloride. Praise the Lord. Amen. Did you believe that? When they spoke to you, did you believe it? Okay. No, uh, please give the microphone. Let, let, let me. When they told you that if you mix sodium and chlorine under certain conditions, it will react and give you salt that you put in soup. Did you believe it? I didn't believe it until I saw it being... Um, or oh, when you saw the experiment, that is when you believed. Yeah. So after you saw the experiment, you believed it. Yes. Praise the Lord. Did it change your life? No. Okay. Do you see how you can believe something? So there, there are beliefs and there is a belief. Now she believes that if you mix sodium and chlorine, you get salt. And that is true, right? It's a fact. Amen. How many of us believe that? I also believe that the salt we eat, if you mix sodium and chlorine, you get table salt. That is one belief. But it is not a belief. Now let me give you another thing. Suppose you are in this room. This is your house. All the doors are locked. And somebody comes in the window. And shouts to you and says, Sister, you are in that house. There are so many snakes in the ceiling. That house is infested with snakes and they are in the ceiling. And because there's a hole in the ceiling, they always creep and come down when places are dark to come to the house. And you are in that house. If you believe that man, what will you do? First, you run away from that house. 
You start to bang the door, open the door for me. And you call a savior from outside who is not trapped to come and open the door for you. And you go out. Now, compare the belief of the snake and the belief of the sodium chloride. Which one is true belief? The one that you believe there's a snake and it might bite you. And you take action because the person who announces that use this door and go out. And you start to look for the door immediately. That word is the word of God that says do A, B, C to be free from this world. Because the snake of this world is about to swallow you. The word says that the devil is moving around like a lion seeking for whom to devour. It's not that you might be killed. You will be killed, destroyed by the devil if you don't have God. Now when you hear that, you believe and you said he gave an instruction. The instruction is that I should find the door and go out. And you immediately get up and you start to act on the instruction of that man. When you are acting, did you see any snake? No. You are acting because the man who spoke to you is faithful. He will not deceive you. So by acting on the word of that man, your faith is in that man. When Jesus speaks to us, and we consider Jesus credible, that he does not lie, then we act on his word. If we believe we obey his word, it leads to salvation. Do you get that? So belief plus obedience equals to faith. But the belief of the Bible is actually belief that brings obedience. Amen. So you see too, there are many people who come to church, they believe like in the chemistry class. There are others who come to church and they believe like in the snake story. If you are in the same house, two of you, and that man gives an announcement to you, to two of you, and says, Go out of that door. That is the only solution for you to move out and abandon that building. To remove that building from your heart. And go out. And your other colleagues say, ah, that word he's preaching is not the one I like to believe in. I don't like to believe in snakes or believe anything about snakes. I'll still remain in the house. And you, you obey and go out. Two of you who believed, the one who acted on the word is the one who believed. Now let me tell you who a believer is. A believer is the one who acts on the words of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. If you say you are a believer in this church, and when you hear the word of God, you do nothing about it, you are not a believer. Forget it. Don't deceive yourself. You are not a believer of Jesus Christ. Because I just demonstrated that if she has faith in the person who spoke, that the person is talking about snake in the ceiling, the person is speaking the truth, she will act. Do you know that when you don't act on the word of Jesus, when he speaks, without you even considering it, the truth in your subconscious is that you don't take Jesus seriously. Do you get that? Every word that we don't obey comes from the fact that we don't take Jesus seriously. If we take him seriously, we will tremble and obey the word. Are you clear, sister? The difference between faith and belief. In the Bible, there's no difference. But in our understanding, there is a difference. And we need to establish that difference and identify which one is the, the true belief. A belief that leads to obedience is the one that is called faith. Yes. That's right. One um, being Abraham, who is the father of faith. Yeah. Distinctly, I mean, he is specifically known as the father of faith. Yes. And when we went to the scriptures, you mentioned that he was the first believer of, the first Christian. 
The first one who believed exactly the way a Christian should believe is Abraham. Yes. So, yeah, my question is that since we went through um, the generations before Abraham. Yes. The, we saw different characteristics like Enoch, Noah, and all of them, right? And then when it came to Abraham, God chose, God decided to start a nation with Abraham. Yes. Now, I'm asking this for since the scriptures admonishes us to learn from their examples. Yes. Um, the, my question is this, that why did God start a nation specifically with Abraham, not with Enoch, whom pleased God with his faith so much that he was translated, not with Noah, who built the ark and even raised his children to a point that they could enter the ark. But God chose with Ab- I mean, to start a nation with Abraham. And when you read the life of Abraham, you see the many mistakes that he did. You know, I mean, when you look at the Bible, what the Bible says about Noah is that he was perfect in the sight of the Lord, in the sight of the Lord. Mm-hmm. And not only, I believe, not only with his behavior, you also see that with his genealogy, there was no Nephilims in between. His genealogy was pure, as God has created it from Adam, mm-hmm. still. So showing that he's still, you know, right. But why did God choose Abraham, who had so many mistakes? Praise the Lord. One will ask, what did God, why did God choose us who have so many mistakes to lead this church? Amen. Praise the Lord. Because of Jesus Christ. Now, I have two answers for you. The Holy Spirit will give you more and perfect answers. But listen. The first is that God is a very wise God. And people demonstrate faithfulness to God at different dimensions. There are many people who are so heaven conscious that they might not even be useful on, on, in, the king, in building God's kingdom on earth. There are people like that. But I'm not accusing Enoch because I shall meet him. Praise Jesus. Amen. So what I'm saying is that the first thing is that Abraham was, the faith of Abraham is peculiar. It is one of the most difficult things that should happen to a man. To ask you to totally separate completely. Including your own father. And go away. The only place where it tells us to be disciples. Which is something, a condition that was given to Abraham as well. Is in Luke 14. Can we read it? Luke 14, 25. And listen. Listen. To the three things that the Bible says we must sacrifice to be disciples. Or the three groups of things. The first group. Let me read from verse 26. He's speaking to the crowd. Not to the disciples. To the crowd. That if anyone wants to be my disciple. Now this is the first group of conditions. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Do you see that condition? That condition, Brother Paul, I call it being free from any other authority in life. Where's Sister Mado? Amen. Who is she fellowshipping with? Mama Mado. I want to fellowship with you. And I don't see people's faces. I tend to be concerned. Come let me fellowship with you, Mama. Praise the Lord. Amen. God will grant you grace. Amen. Praise the Lord. The first condition to being a disciple of Jesus Christ is to reject 
all authority over your life and leave only the authority of Jesus Christ. So that anything that anyone suggests to you, if ever it contradicts anything that God wants you to do, you reject it. That's the meaning of hating all these people. Your family carries great authority. Even your junior brother can make you stumble. They tried in Jesus' life. Praise the Lord. That's the first condition. Abraham went through it. God did not only say that he must cut off from that authority, but move out. Because in the days of Abraham, it was even serious. That was immediately after the Tower of Babel. And magic began to increase in the world. When Nimrod was ruling the world. There's much non-biblical history between Abraham and Nimrod. You might want to check it if you have time. But I even advise you read your Bible and forget about those history. Because it was not bringing you salvation. But I want to tell you that there was a serious conflict between Abraham and Nimrod. It was not a simple thing to believe God in the land of Shina. And God spoke to him. And he had to get up and oppose who? The first antichrist, Nimrod. And God said, separate. Because it was not easy to oppose Nimrod. It is like today. Every Christian is telling you, let us go to that prophet to receive our miracle. And when you stand and say, no. Give your heart to Jesus and forget these prophets. They oppose you also. The world is opposing you. The church is opposing you. That is it with Abraham. His surrounding is opposing him. His family also is opposing him. Extended and immediate. So if you listen to instruction, he said, leave your people, your kindred, your nation. Praise the Lord. Abraham also, sorry, let me not get there now. Abraham obeyed. But you understand why he allowed his father to come with him. It wasn't God's will for Abraham's father to come with him. And when Abraham's father came to a place called Haran, he chose to settle there because he didn't want to go as far as the full will of God. Did you get that? He chose to settle somewhere. And he delayed Abraham's calling for some more time. What did God do? That authority in his life had to die for him to become a true disciple of Jesus Christ. And he moved from there and walked in tents. Listen, do you know that where it is said that these people were looking for a city whose builder is God? He was referring specifically to Abraham. Although the root of that was in all the people who had faith. But it's Abraham who was looking for a city. And we saw in the Bible that the city that God promised Abraham, that God spoke to Abraham about, is the city of Revelation chapter 21, the new Jerusalem. Abraham was looking for it into, in Israel, in the land of Canaan. He was moving from place to place. He comes and stays and he says, perhaps the city is around here. He doesn't see it. He moves his tent to another place. Maybe the city is there. He doesn't see it until he died. That is a Christian. Who lives forever expecting Jesus to come from heaven and has nothing with this world except to convert some people to Christ. Praise the Lord. That is the first answer. The second answer is the timing. God works in dispensations. At that time, God needed a man to start something because the whole world had been corrupted. He needed a man. Just like in the days of Noah, God needed a man. And Noah was available to fulfill at that time. This is the most important answer I'm giving you. Because in the generation in which we live now, where every top preacher with thousands of mega churches have corrupted the gospel, God is looking for a man. You might be that man. You might be available to stand for God to give you the truth to give to these people. In the days of Abraham, Abraham was fully available. 
Therefore, when the need for that time was to start a new nation. And Abraham was the only man of faith that existed. In the days also of Noah, God also wanted to start a new people, a new race. And Noah was available. In the days of Enoch, the times were different. God has not reached a level to destroy everyone and start another one new. He will have started perhaps with Enoch. Then he said, this Enoch is so pleasing to me that I should rather take him to be with me. Praise the Lord. In the days of Abel, they have just begun the race. And God was not about to start another nation. So each person serves God in his own generation given the times. We must be able to recognize our time and ask ourselves, what is God about to do? Let me give you an example. Daniel went as a slave to Babylon. After 70 years, he read the book of Jeremiah and discovered that God's plan for them to be in slavery is 70 years. He began to pray in Daniel chapter 9. How many of you are praying? Praying, not, not prayer. Lord Jesus, you promised me that by this time you give me a child. Now I'm still childless. That's not the prayer I'm talking about. That's stupid prayer. Praise the Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus, you said I will not lack food. But now I don't know what my children and I will eat tomorrow. This food is only for today. That is not the prayer I'm talking about. That is materialistic prayer. I'm talking about when you come and when God opens your eye to see a great plan in the prophecy of God, in God's Bible, in his word. And it shakes your whole being and you go on your knee and say, Lord, this must happen. Your will will be done. And you start to pray. That's what happened to Daniel. Daniel said, I learned by the books. That our captivity was to last for 70 years and it, was, it has clocked 70 years. He said he asked God whether perhaps he might have something to do about the plan of moving people out. As it turns out to be, Daniel was praying for his people to come out of captivity and he was hoping that God might use him for one thing or the other. Do you know why he had that hope? Because Daniel was in a position of authority in that nation. He thought that maybe God might instruct me to sign a paper or something. Do you know that what God brought to Daniel was bigger than just coming out of Israel? The vision God gave Daniel after that prayer is all about the end time and the very coming of Jesus Christ, the first coming and the second coming and the end of all things and the new kingdom. Because he carried a burden. What I'm saying is we must be able to recognize what God's needs are for a given time. And these are the people, and usually, especially in the corrupt time we're living in like now, God is looking for a man. And you may be surprised that there may be no man. Usually God's plans have delayed for a couple of years because either there was no man or the man was not ready. Or the man could have been you. But you are busy looking for food instead of looking for God. Do you know that God's plan for the Jews to come out of Israel, Egypt, delayed? Because of the lack of readiness of Moses. We talk about the faith of Moses. But it took God time to prepare Moses. Long. If you calculate the excess time that the Jews spent in the world in, in Egypt, compare it to the prophecy that God gave Jacob. Praise the Lord. If you compare both, you are going to realize that the excess time is equal to the time that Moses needed to be trained in the wilderness. Did you notice that? Because he was not ready. Why was he not ready? It took a long time. To remove the Egyptian ways from him. Most of us are still worldly. We still have worldly ways. And God said, I can't use you like that. I need to work in your life. But when God wants to work, no, no, Lord, it's too much. It's too much. Lord, give me chicken, not, not give me chicken and soup. 
God wanted to use them in the wilderness. They were looking for chicken. They were not satisfied with God's dealing with them. So, Brother and Paul, read the times. Jesus said that you are able to predict weather. But you cannot, you cannot discern spiritual timing. They were able to predict weather. Weather prediction did not start today. This is... Uh, uh, magicians were there a long time. They were able to predict weather. That if you see this kind of cloud, it's about to rain. But do you know if they could discern spiritual weather, they would have recognized Jesus standing in front of them. But they didn't recognize Jesus because they could not predict spiritually. We are so carried by the world, carried by materialism, our minds are so corrupted that we hear no whisper from heaven. And I pray that we can really get up on our feet and start to see God. Lord, what is it for this time that you want me to do? That we be done. Praise the Lord. I want to create a scenario where on one side you have a Christian who believes that there is God. Yes. Believes about the power of creation, uh -huh. the formation of man, and the air that is breath in man. The formation of the clouds, mm -hmm. the roaring of the thunder, and all that. On, on the other hand, you have somebody who doesn't believe in God. He doesn't yeah. believe in the scriptures. He has scientific explanations for everything. About, for everything. How else can you, as a Christian, convince this other person that there is God? The first thing I want to tell you is that God has not sent us to convince the inconvincible. That's the first thing. If somebody is stupid enough to look at all of these things and say that there is no God, he is at the lowest depth of his life. He needs to come up to some level. You need to keep talking to him about God. Now, God is not proven. Amen. Amen. And God cannot be explained beyond what Christ has already given us. The Bible says Christ came to explain God as Father. You cannot prove God to people. If anyone wants proof before he believes in God, leave him alone. When you prove something already scientifically, there's no faith needed. Many people, let me tell you, the group of people who end up believing in Christ, although their belief is not groundbreaking, there are those in physics who are called astronomers. Those who study cosmology. The stars, that's the one group of people. When they venture into the universe, they conclude that there is God without hearing any voice. I know a preacher like that. His name is Chuck Mesler. He was an astrophysicist and he believed in Christ through physics. When he saw the marvelous things out there, he knelt down and said, the Big Bang Theory must be wrong. God must have created this. Science has deceived me. When people discover true science, it links them to God. The Bible says that it is the glory of God to hide things and it's the glory of kings to dig them out. That's research. And please, do not carry on research because there's much more glory in serving Christ like we do here. Praise Jesus. So then what I'm saying, brother, is that the Bible begins with, in the beginning, God. You will have ex expected a preamble of the Bible first. To say God came from this direction and then became like this and then transformed into this and became the God as we know it who began to create. There's no history about God. You know, there's no history given about God. Because even if God gave a history lesson about his own origin, you will not understand. Amen. Praise the Lord. So if you find someone who wants proof before he turns around to God, there's enough proof. Listen to what the book of Romans tells us. That nature itself is sufficient proof to anyone who doesn't have the Bible. Amen. Praise the Lord. Before Jesus began his ministry, 
he pleased God for 30 years. And at his baptism, God said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus did not please his father by displaying the power that raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus did not please God the Father by miracles. He pleased God the Father by, the, by self-denial and living for the will of God right in the house. You see, young people, you live with parents. How do you be, behave with imperfect parents? How do we behave in situations of life, as Brother Edgar said? Abraham had lived in, the, in this wicked land of Shina and pleased God for some time. God did not appear to Abraham one day and say, leave this place. Abraham lived as a faithful Christian in that land for some time before God called him out. Although that is not given to us. Secondly, and very important, is that whenever God makes a pronouncement upon your life, the devil turns his attention on you. And that we must be careful, especially with genuine men of God. Satan is after them and their children. We need to pray for them. Praise the Lord. But if God has not pronounced anything about you, Satan leaves you alone. That's what I want you to, I want you to know. So there is more temptation for servants of God than for ordinary Christians. Because Satan brings a battle to them. Amen. Amen. And the Lord is faithful. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, Pastor, I've just been wondering what lessons we learned from the report that was given by Joshua when the twelve were asked to go out and to bring back a report to Moses. What do we learn from there? And the second one was when Peter asked Jesus when if he, he could build three tents, what's the significance of that? Praise the Lord. I usually, brother, do not want us to speculate on scripture. I always want the scripture to speak to us in plain language. Amen. Amen. Now, what the scripture says about that report is that when they went to that land, they saw giants and they saw God. They chose to describe the giants and not God. And Joshua and Caleb chose to describe God and not the giants. That's the difference. So in life, you always see giants in your flesh and around you, preventing you to live the Christian life. You can choose to describe the giants or to describe God who said, because you live under grace, sin shall not have dominion over you. So what you become depends on what, who you constantly see. These people went to that land. They did not see God. They saw giants and a good land. Joshua and Caleb went to that land. They saw, they did not see giants. Praise the Lord. We don't have time to read that passage. It can become a message for a full day. But listen. When those people came back, the ten, who gave that report, they saw two things, three things there. They saw a good land, as God said. They saw the giants, and they saw themselves. Amen. Now, when Joshua and Caleb went there, they, listen, the people saw three things. Joshua and Caleb saw two things. They saw the land, and they saw God. They didn't see themselves. When the people came to give report, they said, the people are so great, so big, that we, 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 compared to them, we are like grasshoppers. Joshua and Caleb said, our God is great. He has promised that land. He will give it to us. It's a good land. That's all they said. Do you see that? What do you see? 
You see your ego and you see your troubles around you and you see the good things of this land. But you don't see God. You will perish in the wilderness. But if you see only two things, God and his promise, you will enter the promised land. And what is the significance of the promised land? The giants represent the deep-rooted sins that sit in this flesh. Because the book of Hebrew explains it to us that to them God said, you shall not enter my rest. And to us is the same thing. If God says that you shall be free from worldly and selfish attitude and be Christ-like and you don't believe it, you will never enter God's rest. You will never enter the promised land. Praise the Lord. Um, Pastor, I wanted to ask, um, because the Bible says that um, born-again Christians are called, right? We have been called. We have been chosen yes. to, to worship Christ. So I wanted to ask, um, are there certain, because I understand that life comes from God, so yeah. are there certain people uh, who are born for destruction, like they are just born for destruction, their hearts are forever going to be hardened towards the things of the Lord. Maybe perhaps reason being that maybe they are not called or chosen. Is it possible for, to say, is, it, is it safe to say some people are, are born for destruction? There is a theory like that which blames God for, the, for people's wickedness. They say I'm wicked because God wants me to be wicked. He didn't call me. Now, um, there's, oh, there's actually a book. Have you, uh, no, I don't want to ask whether you've read the Gospel of Judas. Don't read it. Praise the Lord. Because there's a, another theological doctrine about Judas. That doctrine says that... That doctrine says that it's God who ordained Judas to serve him by betraying Jesus because God was looking for someone to betray Jesus and didn't find it, but found Judas. Therefore, Judas is a wonderful servant of God and he is not evil. He cannot even be called the son of perdition. That's the gospel of Judas. Now, that question you are asking is from Romans chapter... It's chapter 9, Pastor. Uh, did you say Romans chapter 9? No, let me go to Romans chapter 8 first. Verse 29. Let me read. And please, sister, listen and note the passage. When you go, you study. The Holy Spirit will also speak to you that God cannot be accused for our wickedness. It is our heart particularly. That makes us take foolish decisions and the decisions lead us to destruction. Amen. Verse 29. For those whom God foreknew, he also predestined. Do you see that? Please listen. The difference, what we need to take note of in order to understand why some people seem to have been called and others not, is the foreknowledge of God. That is, God beforehand knows all your steps and knows that when the gospel comes, you will reject. You will live wayward. You will be a drunkard. You will not love God. Even if God struggles, you will not love him. Your heart will always go to wicked things. He foreknew that. Then he also foreknew that this is my brother. He will struggle with many things. But in his heart, he's fighting to come out. He wants to be free, though he's struggling. So God foreknew, and he predestined you even though you will have mistakes. But he knows that you are not yielding to the devil's will. Foreknowledge. That's what we don't have. We don't have foreknowledge. We don't know what God knows about the future. Amen. So the people whom God predestined are only the ones that he did so according to what he already knew about them concerning their choices. Did you get that? 
So God does not wholesale condemn somebody before time. Even though he knows everything, he still gives you the chance. Did God know that Judas is the son of perdition? Yes. But do you know that God gave all the chance to Judas to become like Peter and Paul and Judas failed because of his heart situation? Hallelujah. Go and sit down. Praise the Lord. Now, for those who God for you, he also predestined to be what? Listen carefully. This is the whole will of God spoken here concerning the matter of which our sister is asking. First, God for you. And when God for you, he predestined. He didn't predestine us to worship Jesus. He did not predestine us to move around and preach the gospel. He did not predestine us to do something. He predestined us to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ. Have you seen that? Before everything else, he said, there are people I will call from the world who've been held captive by the devil, but they have set their heart to seek for me. They will become like my son Jesus. And I will look at them the way I look at Jesus. They will be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. My image that was destroyed in Adam will be restored in them. That is the plan of God. It's not for everybody. It is for those whom God foreknew that they will take decision towards that direction. That's why the, the gospel comes to two people. One rejects and one accepts. You can't blame God for that. Amen. But God knows beforehand. He could influence. He chooses not to influence. He lets you make the choice. And when you make your choice... He sees the direction of your choice. He joins you if it is towards him. If it's away from him, he leaves you. He doesn't fight with the devil over souls. If the souls want to follow the devil. That's why many people ask, but why is God allowing many people to follow after prophets? The Bible says that their hearts, what they desire is what God will allow them to get. If you desire prophets, you get prophets. If you desire Jesus, you get Jesus. Praise the Lord. Uh, Pastor, since we are looking at the heroes of faith, uh, my question is based on Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19, where the Bible says, Ab Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figura figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. So you might be in a situation, maybe you are sick, mm -hmm. and you believe that the Lord will heal you and he does not heal you. Then you find yourself that your faith is being weighed down. You have lost. Can you say that the faith that you had in the beginning is fake or you have sinned or something like that? Please, get the understanding of how Abraham glorified God. God told Abraham, Abraham was not sick. It is not a matter of healing. God told him, this is a healthy child. Go and kill him for me. What you have that is good, there's nothing wrong with it. It came from God. Give it back to God. Abraham took Isaac. And something told Abraham, this your Isaac will die and you have no Isaac. Abraham told that thing. That thing must have been the devil. That sorry. You don't know that my God can raise the dead. At that time, no one has ever been raised from the dead by God for Abraham to see. But Abraham got a revelation of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in his heart because he was determined to obey God. It's different from when you are sick and you are desperate for God to give you healing. That one is selfish. There are two different situations. You get that? When you are sick, you are desperate for God to give you something. In this case, God wants to take something from you. Something you value dearly. He wants to take it. And as you are struggling, Lord, I will give to you. And the voice of the devil tells you, this is your only child. How can this God who says he loves you take it from you? And you tell the devil, my God can resurrect people. He will resurrect this man. Abraham found every reason. And God gave him the revelation to not to disobey. We always find every reason to disobey God. If we could have an explanation why we should disobey here, we would take it. 
But Abraham was looking for a reason not to disobey. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Romans chapter 1 verse 17. The Bible says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So my question is that, what does it mean for the righteousness of God to be revealed from faith to faith? Is there, is, there a degree, is there a degree of faith when it comes to the righteousness of God being revealed? Praise the Lord. Actually, um, yes, there's a degree of faith, but that passage is not talking about the degree of faith. Amen? Before we speak about it, let's read a bit the passages before and after. Romans 1, let's start from verse 16. It says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you all there in your Bibles? Amen. It says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it is the power of God. For salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jews. Then for the Gentiles. Because in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from beginning to end. As it is written, the righteous will live by faith. I'm reading from NIV. King James Version says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jews first, and also to the Greek. For therein, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Where, how do I know? The passage that is quoted there is Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. The righteous shall live by faith. Not just live by faith one day, but live by faith the rest of their lives. We don't get excited that we did one act of faith here today and then tomorrow we live according to the flesh and one day we suddenly do another act of flesh or, or faith. That is not what we've been called for. We've been called to enter into faith and live in faith, live through faith until the end. So that passage means this, that in the gospel of Jesus Christ, as opposed to the Old Testament, there is a righteousness that is revealed. A righteousness that depends on faith as opposed to the righteousness of the Old Testament that did not depend on faith, but on your ability to try and keep the law. Praise the Lord. If you look at that passage, the Bible says you are saved by grace through faith. If you look at the passage, it's complete. Therein, in the gospel, a righteousness is revealed that comes, the beginning is by faith, right to the end is by faith, and everything is by faith. That is exactly what the Holy Spirit has taught us. That when you have faith, it leads to righteousness. The righteousness of God. And the righteousness will increase you to perfection. And everything is by faith. Praise the Lord. It says that in the power of God, in, there is a power of God, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. That power of God is what is, what is grace. But if you take the translation and the interpretation of many preachers today, they say grace is unmerited favor. But that is not grace. It's only a part of grace. Wherever you see power that leads to salvation, it is actually grace. If you look at the passage carefully then, you use your faith 
to get the grace of God. And the grace of God works in you to bring godliness, which is the righteousness that God is looking for. God's own way of responding to situations of life. And that righteousness increases until you get to perfection. And what is perfection? The very nature of Jesus Christ. You become Christ-like. That's the ultimate end of the scripture. Praise the Lord. That is what that passage means. The passage means that from beginning to end, it is by faith and there's no room for any other logic or flesh or any intervention. If you began your Christian race by faith, you must take it on by faith until the end. Until Christ comes. Praise the Lord. Amen. Therefore, yes, faith is in degrees, but the passage is not referring to the degrees of faith. It's referring to the consistency of your faith for you to be safe. Amen. Because you can have faith today and tomorrow you don't have faith. And after some time you have faith again. That's not, when, when your faith is like that, you might lose your salvation altogether. Hallelujah. Continue, brother. Next question. You have a long list of questions there. Yeah, the second one is, is there a difference between little faith and great faith? And then there are some Bible passages that are listed there yes, in relation I took them. to... Yeah. yeah. And then you, can, I, you can sit down because there's little faith and great faith. Praise the Lord. And we're going to take time on them. Um, we're going to go through all the Bible passages you listed and a few others that we might read. Amen. And look at them carefully to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Brothers, the first thing I want to mention to you is that all those discourse about great faith that Jesus is referring to, he is talking to people who are not born again. Remember. Amen. Praise the Lord. So I first want to let you know that to a one group, something can be great, and that what is great faith to them will not be faith at all to us when we are already in Christ. Amen. Take, for example, if you come from a poor family, what you call great money is different from what someone coming from the rich family will call great money. If, so, if you are in a household, you grew up in a household where every time you are going to school, they give you 500 rand. You go and do whatever you like with it because your father is very rich. He's always pouring money at you because you're the son. Right? Then there is this other poor person who goes to school at times, no money. Then occasionally they give him two runs, five runs. They say, you buy magunyas and eat. Take these two people and put together and ask them, what is great money? The poor one will tell you 500 is great money. The rich one will tell you that even 10,000 rand is not great money at all. Praise the Lord. Because we have seen a higher level of faith in Christ, what Christ is calling great faith is in reference to the people's level. That's the first thing you need to note. I want to let you know that all the people we are reading about here, although they manifested what Christ will call great faith, that great faith when it comes to us is no faith. Amen. Because they still belong to the old order. Even the faith of the disciples when they were walking with Christ on earth when the Holy Spirit had not yet come could be called great faith, but it was still nothing. See Peter's life before he had faith and after the Holy Spirit came. Then I want to point something to you. When the Holy Spirit came and the church began, there is no mention of great faith. That is, we are supposed to, rather, the attention shifts from the size of faith to the quality of faith. Genuineness of the faith. Amen. Because these people were using their great faith to seek for the things that the Old Testament people would be seeking for. And Jesus will grant them according to the Old Testament order. But in the New Testament, our faith, there's more attention to the quality as opposed to the greatness Yet there is great faith in the New Testament which I will show you and that great faith is a gift. Because you have a question in relation to the gift. Because there are some people, every believer must have the true kind of faith of good quality to be saved. But there are some believers amongst us who have great faith which is a gift. To do some things beyond just salvation. And I'll make the distinction on that. 
Praise the Lord. Let us now look at the passages. The first is Matthew chapter 6. And I'm going to be pointing to you that they all relate to righteousness, even if it is material. I will give you, I'll point to you the spirit behind it. Matthew chapter 6. If we are in Matthew chapter 6, let's go to verse 30. Are we all there? Praise the Lord. It says, Wherefore, if God clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Now look up, please. If you read that passage carelessly, you might think that Jesus is saying you use your faith to go and get beautiful clothes. To become like the flowers. But I want to point to you something as I was prayerfully meditating on this verse when Brother Charles gave it. Please listen carefully. Jesus is referring to them, O ye of little faith. When your faith, which is your dependence, your total dependence and leaning on God, because he is all loving, he is all powerful, and he knows all things. These are the three things that we talk in relation to faith at the introduction. That faith is total leaning, trust, and submission to God in view of his total love for us. Praise the Lord. His almighty power and his, his all knowledge. Amen. Praise the Lord. And now, we say that if God is all loving and God is all powerful, that there's nobody as powerful as God, and God is also all-knowing, then if anything happens to his children, then it is not because someone overcame him for the thing to happen to you. You get that? That's the first thing. It means that he knowingly allowed it. Because you could say that God did not know. If he knew, he would have allowed it. Then your God is not Jehovah. Amen? And that is... Christians think like that without knowing. That if God only knew that I'm going through this situation, he would have helped me. No, anything you go through, he knows it. Second, you could say that, yes, he knows, but he's powerless because the devil has overcome him and the devil is now beating me and there's nothing God can do. You also, that God that you are talking about is also not Jehovah. Because our God is the almighty God, right? Therefore, if he knows something, all things and allow some things to happen to you and he's also all powerful you must say it's because this God does not love me enough and therefore he doesn't care what happens to me although he knows it is powerful he can help me then you are misquoting and misrepresenting the God that Jesus came to explain to us as a father a loving father now if you believe in the love of God or you believe in God because of his love for you. And you know that God is all powerful. And God knows all things. When anything happens to you. You will thank him and tell him that whatever is going on. That you don't know because you are too limited. He is in charge. That is faith. Praise the Lord. That is how we define faith. Which has two legs. One in, is on things that God has already done. And one is on things that shall still happen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for in the future. And the evidence of things not seen. They are already here, but your eyes cannot see. But you depend on God for them to happen to you. Praise the Lord. And if that is then the case, you look at this verse, Matthew 6, 30. 
Jesus is saying that when you don't lean on God, you tend to worry, and in your worries, you use worldly ways of doing things in order to get something. What is that? Unrighteousness. That is, you might have a legitimate concern about clothing for yourself and your children. But because you don't have faith, you go about it the ungodly way. Your lack of faith and your need for clothes has led you to unrighteousness. Therefore, you can see how many women have given themselves to men because they legitimately want a cloth to wear. That is a mark that they don't have faith in God. If they had faith in God, their faith will lead to righteousness because the faith will tell them that even if this man wants to help me and gives me a condition, I will reject his help because my God can help me. My God can clothe me. Do you see the connection between that verse and righteousness? And if you understand, all the other verses are still the same. What he's saying is that you don't use your faith to go about looking for good clothes and by faith you possess it from someone's shop without money. What he's saying is that if you lean on God, you will not do certain things because you are desperate for some things of life. You will still be righteous no matter the circumstances because you so trust God that even if you don't have it now, if it is a needed thing, God will meet your need. Because that passage, Matthew 6, Jesus says that whatever you need, if you seek first the kingdom of God and the righteousness of God, then it shall be given. If you look at it in that context, that seek first the kingdom of God and the righteousness of God, it means you take your faith to produce righteousness in your life and let every other thing be given by God. But if you ignore that, you ignore the righteousness of God, you will use human righteousness and demonic righteousness to gain things in this world and you'll be ungodly. And therefore, that is the proof that you don't have faith. Did you get that? Because the more we go deeper into the word of God, the more God gives deeper revelation to let us know that what the Holy Spirit has given to us is true. Amen. Because if we read this casually, it might be interpreted as saying, okay, if you have faith, you have good clothes and you look like the flowers. But that is not what Jesus is saying. He's saying that if the useless flowers out there, God will clothe them. Why are you worried in life? And your worry is leading you to doing wrong things. Why don't you have peace in you? Because you don't have. Praise the Lord. And I want to tell you this frankly, brothers and sisters. God is able to take care of his own. God is not in the business of making them millionaires, as preachers say. But everything that you have as a need, every need that you have, God being your father, if you depend on him, he will meet your needs. I tell you the truth. Amen. Although today I'm working, but when I look back the way God has led me to this level, I can tell you that God leads those who belong to him. And God provides for those who belong to him. Amen. And if you are in any sort of need, let's hold on together. But trust God. Because God will not let you suffer. But he, in any suffering, he might want to correct something in your life. But as a father, he will always provide for you if you trust him. But if you have a divided heart, you want to trust the devil and trust God at the same time, it will not work. You end up getting it from the devil and you come and give the testimony in church that is God who gave you. At the last day, everyone will know that it wasn't God. Most of the testimonies of cars, houses, if you go and check carefully, you will see how much crooked deals were made. Then the person came and testified that it's God who gave him. They are putting God into trouble. And God is in heaven and angels are surprised. Did you really lead this one to do all of these things and get this? When people come to give testimony, they polish it. So-called testimony, they polish it. They, tell, they make stories of how God gave them. They don't tell you how they sold drugs and got it. They don't tell you how they kill and got it. They don't tell you how they lied and got it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Brother, is that clear? Yes, please. Let's go to the next passage. The next passage is, is using the same principle that the Holy Spirit just gave me this morning concerning this verse. I had never had this revelation about it before that these things are all connected to righteousness. 
is as I meditate on, that the Lord tells me this is related to righteousness. When you don't have these things in your life, and you use your own human ways to get them, you end up doing wrong things, and your unrighteousness in your life gets revealed. But if you have faith, praise the Lord. You see that little noise? It has distracted everybody. Praise the Lord. That's what I was saying. Amen. If you drop a pin, people will forget the word of God and be looking for the pin. Hallelujah. Can we all look up here in Jesus' name? Amen. You say we is you. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'm trying to let you get this. Because the Holy Spirit does not want us to go astray when it comes to the word of God. That if you lack these things and you are trembling to get them, and you don't lean on God, you will do what is wrong to get them. And that will show that you didn't have faith. Because you followed unrighteousness to get clothes. You followed unrighteousness to get food. Because you didn't even believe God that he will give it to you. And therefore you must maintain your Christ-like nature and wait for God. Take for example, the Hebrew boys, they were to be put in the fire. Because they wanted them to behave in an unrighteous way by worshipping an image. They said, no, we cannot. Our God is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we will not. So what do you say? Especially women. You tell that boy or that man, my God is able to clothe me. You quote him this verse. You say, but even if he doesn't clothe me, I will not sleep with you. That is how the Hebrew boys taught us. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. My God is able to give me food, but even if he chooses not to give me food, I will not bow to you. I prefer to be hungry in demonstration of my leaning on my God than to bow to you and get food. Did you get that? That is the true faith. Now, the counterfeit of it is the devil quickly leads people to interpret in a shallow way. Do you see that? Have faith so that you can have clothes. That is wrong. Amen. Have faith so that you can have righteousness. When the devil brings the pressure, the pressure of clothing, you don't fall. Because you lean on God, you know that at his own time, he will give you whatever is needful for you. Praise Jesus. Let's go to the next verse. Matthew 8, 26. Please take note of that. Matthew 8, 26 is the same thing and is relating to that situation in the sea. I hope so. Matthew 8, 26. So the background is this. Please listen. That is where Jesus talked of little faith again. The background is that they were going across in the sea and Jesus was asleep. I took time to meditate on this verse. Then I was asking myself, does God play games? Is it that God in heaven will cause the, the sea to get up and become wild? And then the boat will be shaking. Then these disciples will be crying. And then they call Jesus. He comes and calms it up so that God will show how great his son is. I see that that's not the spirit of God. Then I conclude from there as I was meditating that the devil is the one who brought the waves. Who brought the raging sea is Satan. So if we look at that passage, we can see satanic opposition concerning your life. Satanic attack concerning your life. Praise the Lord. Now, the Bible says there that when they woke up Jesus, after they had panicked for some time and looked for their own solution and they could not get it. Did you get that? They struggled to, to balance the, 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 the boat. Remove water from the boat. And things were getting out of hand after they had tried by their own flesh. That is the law. Then one person remembered that we, let's wake Jesus to see what he also can do. And then they won't, when, if you read the other accounts of this same thing, <clears throat> listen to what they told Jesus. Don't you care that we are perishing? What they were telling Jesus is this, listen. They were telling Jesus, how is it that all of us are concerned and you are sleeping? 
Amen. <clears throat> like I'll come back to the house and I realize half of the house is on fire and Brother Charles is busy sleeping. And he knows very well that there's fire, but he's sleeping. I'm not saying if there's fire, you should sleep. Praise the Lord. And he's sleeping. Then I go and knock and shake Brother Charles' door. Get out! Don't you care that this house is burning and people are dying? Then he gets out and stretches his hands and asks me, but what is the problem? <clears throat> that is the picture. So these people are actually saying that they ought to be troubled and agitated together with Jesus himself. Do you get the picture? They want Jesus to be with them trying to see how can we hold this side of the boat so that this wind does not overtake it. Amen. And when they call Jesus, let us look at the passage quickly. That's Matthew 8. 26. Let's start from 23. Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us. Here he says, Lord, Lord save us or we drown. But the other account says, don't you care that we are perishing? Are you not concerned to assist us? Because we are perishing. Jesus gets up. Verse 26, he replied. First, before he replied, let's look at verse 25. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are drowning. Then, verse 26, he replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the wind and the waves, and it was completely calm. Please, let us learn a lesson from this little rebuke of Jesus here. I want to ask you a question. How many times have you made foolish decisions because you were afraid? Did you get that? Because of fear, you went to unrighteousness. You were afraid of what will happen and you did something that was ungodly only because you wanted to save yourself. Not to allow God to save you. There is fear in all its form and so on. Worries. All of those things demonstrate lack of faith. And when you see somebody's life agitated and worried and fearful, that means that that person lacks faith and if you go deep into that person's life, there is unrighteousness. Hallelujah. Please take note. Amen. The Bible says perfect love casts away all fear. And perfect love is the sign of the presence of God. And you get the presence of God by true faith. And if you have the true faith, it takes away all those things that the devil brings to you. Praise the Lord. So the point here is that these people were faithless and their lack of faith led, led them to fearfulness. And because of that, they were trembling before the devil instead of trusting in God. That is why Jesus rebuked them. Then he calmed the wind and the wind was calm. Amen. And some commentators believe that that wind was sent by the devil for Jesus himself. It was, if you look at the life of Jesus, the devil made so many attempts to kill him. Many times. In Luke chapter 4, when he read the scroll of Isaiah, they wanted to push him to the cliff and he walked away unharmed. The devil had made all attempts to kill him and he only died when his father wanted him to die for our sins. Praise the Lord. What we learn from there is that if you believe God, and you know for sure that because of my God and I walk in him, I don't sneak and follow Satan. I cannot die before the day that God has located for me to die. That is a child of God will say, Lord Jesus, I don't want to remain in this world forever. If you want me to come home tomorrow, that is fine. But I don't want to go by the devil either. 
I want you to plan my life. Then you walk according to him. The day you leave this world is the day God himself will determine that you come home. If you believe that, you don't fear anything anymore. That is what the faith they did not have. Praise the Lord. That is a source of fear. Do you know how many things people have done because they want to keep their lives? The fear of death, the Bible says, is what makes us do foolish things. There are people in power, they want to secure their position, they kill children and sacrifice in order to secure their position in rituals. All of this is happening because of the fear in them because of lack of faith. And therefore, it leads them to unrighteousness. Did you get that? In the same way also, these people's lack of faith, the situation is not about the waves. But what Jesus is telling them is that you are in this boat no matter what Satan is doing. Your life is in the hands of God. But if you take it out because of lack of faith, that's when Satan has access to you. Did you get that? Amen. Is that fine? Is it clear? Amen. Please take note. I've said it many times. All of us have various degrees of faith. And therefore we have various degrees of fear and boldness from the Holy Spirit. But many people have died when no one killed them. Fear killed them. Amen. So please listen. If you have faith in God, you don't need to die before your time. When Jesus prayed in John 17, he didn't say that his father should take you from the world. He said, keep them in the world. I'm not saying you should take them away, but keep them from the evil one. Which means that it's not the will of God that any of you should die early, except you are so lazy that you have no, God's plan for you can never be materialized. Then the only option for God is to take you to heaven. Then you die tomorrow. Then those of us who still have something to do with remain alive and do something and follow you after. Amen. So if you choose to go ahead because you have nothing for the kingdom in, on earth, you choose to go ahead, fine. Go, we, we are coming. Praise Jesus. But if you want to remain here, join us. Don't want to remain in life because of your wonderful business ideas and projects. Then you pray and fear. Oh Lord, save me. I have a business plan tomorrow. That's not what God is interested in. Hallelujah. He's interested in those who take genuine interest in the kingdom so that he can use them on earth and therefore there's a valid reason for them to be on earth. But if you are a follower of the devil, your day of death is determined by your master, the devil. The day he decides that you are the sheep to be slaughtered that day, you die that day. What I'm speaking about is for those who belong to Christ and therefore... The Bible says that they are in the, in the palms of Jesus and Jesus is in God. Did you get that? Amen. If you are truly in Christ, that is where you are. And like Christ, no one will kill you before your time. Amen. Things will happen and they will always come and say it's a miracle. He came out alive. Until the day God wants you to come home. And that day, if you are resisting, it is a proof that you were not with God in the first place. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Next verse. 14.31. Matthew 14.31. Matthew 14.31. I think it relates to food. You are going to see that Jesus has addressed all these areas of clothing, fearfulness of situations of life, food, and so on. Now, Matthew 14, 31 is about Peter walking on water. An amazing thing there. Let me give you the background quickly, please. And don't be dis distracted. Now these people are in the boat again in the middle of the night. Riding the boat and going. Jesus is walking on water opposite them and coming towards them. And they see this Jesus walking on top of water. 
And they concluded, they concluded that must be a ghost. And Jesus said, no, it is me. It's not a ghost. Peter said, if it is you, Lord, ask me to come to you. Jesus said, come. Listen carefully, please. Peter could not just jump out of the boat and start to come, out, come to Jesus because he saw Jesus walking. He needed to get the word of God that says, come. Then he acts on it by faith. Anything that you, you do and you say is faith and is not based on what God has spoken is presumption. So Peter had to wait and say, if it's you, ask me to come. And Jesus said, come, before he took step. Faith is taking step based on what God has said. To show that you are leaning on God. Because he said it, you obey because he loves you, he's all powerful, and he knows everything. If he commands you to do it, he knows what to do. And that is exactly true. So at the word of Jesus, Peter gets out of the boat. Starts to walk on water like Jesus. Looking unto Jesus and walking, and the water did not swallow him. The water like the waves, Matthew 7 tells us it represents the problems of life. As long as he was looking on Jesus and not the water, he kept walking through. Listen, whatever the troubles of the world, you can walk through it and make it to the other side with Jesus Christ. But the moment you start to look at the troubles, you start to sing in the troubles of this world. If your eyes are not on the trouble, you walk and you don't see anything, but when you look back, you see that your trajectory is a miracle. The distance that Peter covered on top of water was a miracle. But when he began to look around him, he started thinking that the picture are the situations of life. Brothers and sisters, whatever comes around you, don't pay attention to those things but on God. And surprisingly, you will soon see those things behind you. And you will wonder, the Lord has taken me this far through this way. Praise the Lord. So as he began to look there, listen to what happened. He started sinking. You might have looked into the problem. Looked around in the problem. And you started falling. You can still call on Jesus and he will still stretch his hand and take you. Do you see something? Faith can make you walk on water. That's one level of faith as you are talking about level of faith. Then there is another level of faith for those who are sinking for Jesus to pull them out. It's still another level of faith. Amen. Then there may even be another level of faith for those who are underwater for Jesus to come and meet them there, like Jonah in the fish, in the belly of the fish, and so on. There are different levels of faith indeed. Because when your faith is reducing, your attention to this world begins to increase and you start to sing in the things of this world. Did you get that? The, the glory of this world is also accompanied by significant trouble. But when your faith is on Christ, your eyes are on Christ. That is why I reject every preaching that says you have faith but makes you to look at the material things of this world. That is not godly faith. True faith in that Peter's story is that Peter's eyes were on Jesus. When he removes his eyes from Jesus, his faith was no more. Because he was not leaning on Jesus. He was not looking onto Jesus as Hebrews chapter 12 tells us. So he began to sink into the problems of this world. And usually, please look up everybody. There are people in this church who are sinking into the problems of this world at various degrees. Some of you are getting mad already because of so many problems. Schools are going to reopen soon. Thank God here we have no business with Christmas. Some of you are safe from that. Hallelujah. But I want to tell you how much headache people are going through sinking into the activities and the problems of this world. But listen. If your attention is in those problems, you'll be going deeper and deeper and you'll be stressed and worried and there's no joy in you, no peace in you. Everybody that comes around you, you back to that person like a dog and when someone comes and says, sister, what is wrong? You say, you don't know what I'm going through. Yes, you are sinking, but you are sinking because your eyes are not on Jesus. 
That is why indeed you are right. We don't know what you are going through. How can we know? You a Christian, you remove your eyes from Jesus. Why should I seek to know then? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But when you get your eyes back on Jesus and cry for help, he stretches his hands again and lifts you out of the trouble. Listen carefully. Please take note. Jesus does not deliver you from trouble by, satis- by giving you the needs of your, the desires of your flesh. Did you get that? He delivers you from trouble by lifting you away from that desire so that you don't have it. You, you, you kick it away. Amen. Hallelujah. Let me give you an example. If your problem is lusting after beautiful girls and you got into trouble because of one little girl and you are calling for Jesus' help, do you know how Jesus helps you? He helps you first by taking you out above that situation and removing the lust from you so that you, you and that girl, there's no attraction anymore for you to go back there. But he doesn't deliver you by giving you that girl to you. Did you get that? Because there are Christians who think that God will help me and save me from this trouble by giving me the money I'm looking for and expand my business. It's not necessarily like that. Hallelujah. There will be raging things in the world. But Jesus will lift his own above those, that situation. But we'll still be walking here on earth. I'm saying this because the prophecy in the Bible about this world is that this world will increasingly de- de- deteriorate. The economy will collapse. When the economy is collapsing, God is not going to save you by giving you a special favor while every other person is becoming poor. You become the richest millionaire, you alone. That's not what God is going to do. God is going to lift you above that situation. And as you trust him, you realize that you are able to eat. You, are not, you may not be eating chicken every day, but you still eat and you'll be healthy. And there will be peace in your heart while others are dying of heart attack. Did you get that? In the name of Jesus Christ, may he grant it to us. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. So have we learned the lesson from Peter? Still faith that leads to fear, unrighteousness. Hallelujah. Amen. 16.8, food. Matthew 16, 8. Verse 8, aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, You of little faith, why are you talking amongst yourselves about having no bread? Did you get that? Amen. How many of you have no bread at home? I know you not lift up your hand. Praise the Lord. But listen. Imagine you go back home and you are talking amongst yourself that there is no bread and Jesus comes. What do you think Jesus will ask you? This same question. You of little faith, why are you talking about having no bread? Amen. I want to tell you something about children. Children are never worried that there is no bread in the house as long as they see daddy and mommy at home. Do you know that? Because they know daddy and mommy will supply. It's only when the child is getting mature that it begins to realize that daddy and mommy are not like God. They are not omnipotent. They may not supply. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now listen carefully then. At that time they can start to talk about bread. It is that age, if you are a child now, that your faith needs to bypass your parents and lean on God. But when they are like this, their faith is on the parent. And if the parent is leaning on God, then that child is leaning on the father who leans on God. Do you get that? But they are soon going to realize their father's limitation. When children are children, they think their father can do all things. My daddy can do this and that. So what I want to tell you then is this. Jesus is saying that if you don't have faith, you start to ask foolish questions about God. Do you remember when we read that passage in Malachi? Is it Malachi? God said, you've said terrible things about me. Then later he said, I know where you stay. (laughs) Amen. Praise the Lord. In the same way also, lack of faith can make some believers say terrible things about God. When they start to discuss about bread, the next thing is, but this God doesn't provide us with bread. Why? You remember the passage we read on Friday in John chapter 6, where their attention was only on bread. 
and they were telling Jesus, our forefathers ate manna. What are you giving us? You start to sin. That's an unrighteous question. It's not godly. Because of lack of faith. It's the same thing. Praise the Lord. Amen. I want us to look at chapter 17. Something deeper there. Matthew 17, 15 to 21. But it's particularly chapter 20 where Jesus talks about little faith again. The question is, what is the difference between little faith and great faith? Amen. And the answer is, little faith is faithlessness. And great faith is the beginning of the baby steps for Christians, as you will see. Because all this faith, as we are seeing, is regarding material things. And in the Old Testament, when you see these things, you learn the lessons, the spiritual lessons behind them. That is why when I look at these scriptures, I ask myself, what are the spiritual lessons for us to walk in Christ? Hallelujah. Matthew 17, are we there? I want, us to, I want to read quickly from verse 15. It's a story of the boy with demon possession. Amen. So this boy was demon possessed and the demon will seize the boy, throw the boy. And the boy was, the Bible calls it a lunatic spirit. Should I read it in King James Version? Verse 15, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic. And so vexed. For often time he falls into the fire and at times in the water. Now listen. There is a deep lesson in that passage concerning faith that I want to point to. And everybody should listen. This boy had a de demonic possession. There's, there was a demon in the boy. And it had gotten to a level that the boy became a lunatic. Not thinking straight. When he sees water, he wants to fall into it. When he sees fire, he wants to fall into it. And the Bible also says in King James Version that the demon was vexing the boy. The word vex means some level of anger. That is what makes them manifest. They have some emotions that is unnatural. They start to manifest. That is why every anger is of the devil. The anger of man. That's why the Bible says get rid of all of them. Because many people get demon possessed because they are open to anger and they don't want to renounce anger. So that is the situation. And they, they brought the child first to the disciples. Amen. And the disciples could not cast out that demon. They tried and they failed. Amen. Then they finally took the child to Jesus himself. And I want you to get the response of Jesus to the people first before you learn the lesson about faith because that is what will help you get the lesson about faith. Listen. Verse 17. When they brought the child to Jesus, they explained to Jesus that the disciples could not cure the child. Listen to the response of Jesus in verse 17. Take note, please, if you want to learn something. Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? Did you get something? Faithless and perverse generation. Have you gotten something there? Lack of faith leads you to perversion. And the perversion leads you to open doors for demonic possession. If at home demons are able to enter, attack your children, enter into your children, destroy here, destroy there, there is a perversion that is opening the door. Praise the Lord. The perversion may not necessarily be your own perversion, but it could be by association. Your faith might be strong, but that of your child is not strong enough. And therefore, when you associate with people who are not believers or are not standing in God, and therefore they have certain perversions in their life, you might be strong, but your children are vulnerable. 
Before you know it, I've picked one spirit here, pick one spirit there, and that is how you find believer children being demon possessed. But if you stay strong and you're a believer, you may not be demon possessed because a child of God cannot be possessed by a demon. Hallelujah. But your children may. Because they've not come to maturity and they are vulnerable and open. Praise the Lord. So perversion has to do with lack of faith. Whenever you don't have the true kind of faith, you start to adopt certain things that are not godly. And it gradually leads you to opening up to perversion. Every perversion is demonic. Homosexuality and all of that. Everything that is immoral is, is demonic. It's demonic influence. Sexual immorality is demonic. In case we don't know. When you find that urge to sleep with somebody who is not your husband, who is not your wife, there are demons giving you that. When you submit to it, you simply say yes to that demon. That's why the Bible calls it idolatry. Praise the Lord. And when you keep submitting to those demons, they claim you to be their own. And over time, they cannot let you go. That is why they are, these things are addictive. Please take note of that. Jesus first rebukes them. That is the generation. For lack of faith, which brought them perversion. What does it mean? That if this world all turned to God, order will be restored to this world. The troubles that are on earth, every malaise, every trouble, every sickness, every demonic oppression comes because man opens the door through lack of faith in God. That is why lack of faith in, in God automatically leads you to unrighteousness whether you like it or not. When you don't trust God, you will increasingly be unrighteous. You may struggle not to be unrighteous, but it's like someone who is struggling not to drown, but he's in the water and cannot swim. Did you get that? That is important. Then later, he rebukes the disciple for little faith or faithlessness. What is Jesus saying? Listen. Jesus rebukes the disciples. Let's read, please. There's a deeper lesson here. Verse 19, then the disciples came to Jesus at private and asked, why couldn't we drive them out? He replied, because you had little faith. Please, let me say something here quickly. Listen carefully, please. The devil fears faith that brings righteousness. Did you get that? Amen. Amen. What Jesus is telling the disciple is that this particular devil was too strong. And your faith was too small, therefore your level of righteousness, there is a little bit of perversion of the world in you. And therefore you could not face this other demon. Later he told them in other versions that this one comes by fasting and prayer. But did Jesus fast and pray for that one? No. Listen carefully. If you read in John's version, Jesus tells them that this particular demon if it's you to cast them out, you have to fast and pray first because of your low level of faith and unrighteousness that is dwelling in you. That teaches us a lesson. We fast to break the yoke of unrighteous attitudes inside us in order to be able because you cannot go to cast a demon when you have the same nature of that demon in you. The demon will not obey you. Jesus is telling them, there's something about that demon in all of you. That is why you could not do it. And in humility, we must accept. There are some aspects that you find a demon of, of lust and immorality manifesting on you. You are a leader. You know that you are struggling with immorality. You just excuse yourself to say, no, I, I, I can't. I'll take some fasting first. After I fasted, I cannot deal with this demon. Listen to the lesson of Jesus Christ. If you realize that there are some aspects of your life you are still struggling with, and you find that spirit manifesting, take a time of fast. That's why going forward in church, when someone gets up and we realize this person has issues, as people come to church, you notice they have issues. 
they will start to manifest. We shouldn't just jump and start to chase the demons. We should take a fasting, and in one of our fasting, we pray for such a person. Hallelujah. Do you get the lesson of faith there? It's still about righteousness, brother Charles. That because of your unrighteousness, you are open to this. Yes, brother Paul. Yes. Take, take, take the microphone because we're recording the question and answer sessions. Brother Charles, if I don't finish your long questions, fine. Wherever we stop, we stop. But there's still time. My question is based on the scripture that we just read. Yes. Um, Jesus Christ, when he was called to the situation, yeah. he firstly rebuked the generation. He rebuked the generation, then after he rebuked the disciples. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, but to the generation regarding faith, he said that they are faithless. Faithless. Yes. Mm -hmm. With the disciples, he said that they have little faith. Yes. Meaning that they actually had some, but it was it was it was too little. It was too little. Yes. So my question is that when you look at the scenario where the woman or the person brought the child to Christ, yeah, and Christ could still say to the person that they are faithless, yeah, and the disciples who were with Christ who failed to cast the demon, to cast the demon, Christ says that they are they have little faith. Yeah. So my question is. How is it that the disciples had little faith and the generation, I mean, the person who brought the child to Christ didn't have faith at all, according to Christ, even if he brought the, Christ, I mean, the child to Christ? Now, um, remember, he wasn't even talking particularly to the person who brought the child. He was talking to a, a group. Okay. So there will have been some trust, but that trust is not a New Testament trust. That Jesus can do something. That's what I'm telling Brother Charles that please be careful when Jesus refers to great faith to these people who have not yet become born again. The Holy Spirit is not yet in them. Their great faith is no faith when it comes to the new covenant. Praise the Lord. So the disciples had little faith because they trusted in Jesus. They have been working with Jesus throughout, right? So they trust in Jesus. They are leaning on Jesus. So their faith in Jesus is there, but very small. Very small in one sense. They have not yet adopted the righteousness of Jesus Christ in terms of taking steps in life. So every time they need to, to fast and cleanse themselves of unrighteousness before they face a small demon. But I want to let you know this. After the Holy Spirit came and the Holy Spirit was in them and they had the faith of Jesus. That is when the prophecy that they just shall live by faith came to pass. Do you know that the same Peter when he was walking, the Bible says his shadow will heal the sick and demons will be running away. What happened? Because he entered the new covenant. That is why I'm saying this. Listen carefully. There's none of you possessed by any spirit in this church. If there's any, then you've came visiting. Amen. There's none. If you notice all those who sit around Holy Communion and take Holy Communion in church with us, there's no one possessed. But if somebody comes, just watch. When things become a little bit hot as we pray to God and we worship God and we give the message, that spirit will manifest. We don't need to claim that one of us is greater than the other. Anybody of you walking with Christ in righteousness demons will be un, uncomfortable in your presence if you have the spirit of God and you are seeking for God's presence. You are not compromising because the measure of unrighteousness that is in you determines how weak you are towards demons in the world. But if you have faith that leads to righteousness, the more righteousness you get, the weaker demons become towards you. If that righteousness is the righteousness of God promised, Amen. That comes from faith to faith, as King James puts it. Take note of this. The unrighteous cannot stand and resist a demon. But the righteous can. And let me tell you the good news. 
The moment you fast and cleanse yourself, you can resist the demon immediately because it is not based on your own past works. It's based on what Jesus has done. That's why there's an inherited righteousness and then the righteousness you grow into. So you can use the righteousness of Christ as your own and attack a demon by it. Provided you are repenting. You don't have the practice of the demon inside you. Otherwise you are like him. He will ask you, why are you chasing me away when I'm your friend? Hallelujah. Because there are people sitting in church and the demons are their friends. If you are an immoral person, you are sitting here, you have a boyfriend at home, the demon of immorality is your friend. You cannot say no to him. Hallelujah. If you are a thief, the demon of stealing is your friend. You cannot cast another one from another demon of that same kind from in another person until you say no to, to, to the one in you first. Did you get that? Hallelujah. Are there people who are willing to say no to all this, the influence of this spirit? Then you'll be free. Then when you are walking, demons can, the ones at home, by the time you get home, they will pack and leave. You don't need to talk to them. Hallelujah. Because of Christ in you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Praise the Lord. Amen. Have we understood these principles that the Lord is giving us? In his word. Amen. As we are going along, if some questions are provoked, you can still ask them because Brachas' questions are long. And they are deep also. Praise the Lord. Throw back to that same verse 20 because we are yet to finish reading it. Yes. Now what's the difference between little faith and mustard seed? Faith like mustard seed because we know that mustard seed is one of the smallest seed yes. of any tree that we know. Yes. So when we, when we are comparing little faith, because um, sometimes when Jesus speaks, you look at the context in which he speaks, little faith, and then you look at mustard seed. In that same verse, he said, yes. if you have faith like a mustard seed, mm. you will say to this mountain, yeah. be removed and cast I was going it. there. You, okay. Praise so, the Lord. Uh, yeah, you can talk if there's something. So you I want to ask that in, in relation to what can we actually, was it that the faith that they had, it was, they still had faith, but it was little. Yes. Is it, is it that that little faith that they had was mustard seed itself? That is not the point. <laughs> it was a corrupted faith. Mustard seed is small. Now, Jesus is in that same passage talking of two things. There's the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the New Testament, I told you, the question is not the size of the faith, but the quality of the faith. Genuine faith. So he's telling them, you have little faith, you couldn't cast this out. But if you have the true faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you move mountains. This mountain of this thing could not stand in front of you. What is he saying? The little faith you have is mixed with unrighteousness in you. you. They had not received the righteousness of God through Christ yet. So they were now working based on whatever unrighteousness that they may be in them and they are struggling with it and therefore they had to fast and stress to deny themselves and it's so difficult, the Old Testament approach. But the, most, the smallest faith that they could have if it's of a genuine kind Genuine faith, the, the, the Old Testament after Christ, after the Holy Spirit came, stresses on the genuineness of your faith. That is why the, this series was not about big faith, but true faith. Because most of what is preached now is the Old Testament faith that up to now Jesus calls it great faith in most of them. But when it comes to the Old Testament, he say if you get the true kind of faith, the new covenant faith, like a mustard seed, it will work wonders. And that wonders I'm saying in relation to leading you to righteousness, which comes by faith, so that the demons of unrighteousness cannot withstand you. Did you get that? Amen. So, mustard seed there, smallest of seed, is the faith that any child of God needs to move mountains. Amen. What Jesus is saying is that, the new covenant faith that is required to live a righteous life is so powerful that if you have it small, 
you move mountains with it. And the mountains are not the obstacles to your business. The mountains are the obstacles to your godly walk. Did you get that? If God says, let's go over there, and you want to go there and there's a mountain, that little faith you have, you can move that mountain with it. And that passage is so assuring because I'm sure that apart from corruption of unrighteousness that we indulge in secret things here and there, we come to church and we lift up our hands and everyone say, holy brother, holy sister, when you are at home, you do fishy things. No one knows. These fishy things are the things that make your faith important. And you go pray for big faith. But Jesus teaches us not to pray for big faith, but for faith of good quality. No matter how small. Praise the Lord. Yes, please. talks about uh, that same verse, verse 20. It refers to unbelief on that ve very same verse. Mm -hmm. So the question is unbelief and little faith, how is it connected? Because it should be along the same line. Because when Jesus, I think in another uh, passage, he talks that uh, because of your doubt, God will not answer you. So how is that connected in that regard? Um, unbelief. The, now, I haven't checked the root word. But when you see translation that talks about little faith, it will be a different Greek word from the, the Greek word of faithlessness at all. So that unbelief you are reading doesn't mean total lack of belief in Christ. There's some belief there. But there are elements of unbelief because of unrighteousness. What you need to understand is that whenever you step into unrighteousness or sin in any area of your life, although you are still a Christian, at that point you have some unbelief. If you get off to pray, you realize your prayers are going nowhere. Because your mind keeps dragging you back because of your nature, your situation. It is the unbelief Christ is referring to. Their unbelief was not leading to total perversion like he did with the generation. Praise the Lord. So there's a difference there. Hallelujah. So they still had faith, little faith, but of a perverse kind because of lack of righteousness. Because at that time, no matter what faith they could have, they could not get the righteousness of God. It was not yet time. Hallelujah. So, um, I'm going to skip. There's a great faith about the woman. The Syrophoenician woman. The Canaanite woman. Which I urge you all to read. Praise the Lord. Because otherwise, uh, Brother Charles' question will just take all the time. So there's also the faith of the centurion, the soldier, who is not a Jew. In Matthew chapter 8, he told Jesus, you are not worthy to come to my roof. I'm not worthy that you come to my roof and heal this person. What was the dimension of his faith? He believed in Jesus, that this Jesus is not limited by space to act. Yeah, but the same... I mean, uh, uh, it's also Matthew chapter 8, but I'm not going to read it. There's no time. I'm simply saying, where Jesus calls it great faith, if you notice, they believe in a certain dimension of God that ordinary people will not perceive. Amen. He believed that Jesus is not limited by space. Amen. Now, let me tell you something for you to understand this as great faith. Because of, although I've said that for Christians, this is the basic. There's nothing great about it for Christians in the new covenant. But I want to tell you that the Christians that pastors have taken them to the old covenant, this is great faith. 
Do you know why Christians are running after prophets and, and, and flying to far places for a man to put the hand on them? Because they believe that this man has Jesus sleeping in his room. So if I go to him and he puts his hand on me, the Jesus that is very close to him will become close to me. Then when I come back to South Africa, I leave Jesus there in Nigeria. You, do you see how this, guy's, this man's faith was great faith? Because he was the first person to believe that this physical Jesus is not limited by space. He can stand here and do something in my house. And he received it. That's great faith. Although to us it's supposed to be basic faith because everywhere you are, you know that God is with you. But he's the first person to indicate that this Jesus can be anywhere, can do anything anywhere. But there are Christians today who do not have this basic faith. They think that they have to wait for a man of God to come here next year. Then they go to that man of God and receive their miracle. And they don't have Jesus in them. Did you get that? So do you want to imitate this great faith? What is the lesson there? If you believe that Jesus without me in your life, you still have Jesus. If you have that belief, that is great faith according to Jesus concerning this man. But to you, being a Christian is not a great faith. If you are in Christ, you don't come and enter in Christ in church, then you go back and leave Christ in church and go home. Then you are not a Christian. A Christian is not a Christian on Sunday in church. A Christian is a Christian everywhere, even if the pastor is not there. So if your Christianity depends on my presence in your life, I can tell you you are not a Christian. And I will even tell you don't associate with me anymore. Because you will worship me. Like many people worship prophets out there. Praise the Lord. Do you see the sin that leads people to worshiping idols? This centurion had faith that could overcome that. He didn't need a physical presence to get something from God. Yet it was still material. But we can apply it spiritually. It does not mean that if, there is, if you are sick or your child is sick, you should not trust God for that child. But I'm saying that in the new covenant, our attention is not there. We are higher, far higher on spiritual grounds. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So that is settled. Then in Matthew 15, 28, it's about the Canaanite woman. Interesting story. Go there quickly. I'll quickly give you the background because we'll not read scriptures a lot there because I would give room for, for others. Yo, so many questions remaining. Now look at this woman in your Bibles. The woman comes to Jesus because the daughter was demon-possessed. She asked Jesus to heal that child. And in verse 23, she is talking and talking and talking. Jesus did not answer her even a word. Take note of the background of the woman. This woman is a Canaanite woman. I want to show you, you see, for the centurion, why was his faith the great faith as of that time? Because by faith he understood the dimension of the oppression of God that the other people could not understand. Therefore, he had faith more than others. You must sit there and think God oppressed only like this. But by faith you will, you, will, you will not see any limitation to God. Now this woman is a Canaanite. Canaanites were the people, when the Jews came to that land, they were asked to kill and chase away. By some way, this woman's generation survived. And she's still a Canaanite. So his ancestors are the Nephilims, the wicked. The ones who were so wicked that God said, wipe them out. This is where this woman is coming from. She has no God in her background. She takes her daughter to Jesus Christ. Number one, that is denying her father's gods. Amen. She's breaking tradition and washing her hands from her inheritance and taking her daughter to Jesus. And as she's talking to Jesus, Jesus does not respond after taking the pay to break tradition. Jesus does not respond. 
if you look at the next verse, the disciples respond and say, let's chase this woman away. She's giving headache to you. Did you check that? The woman is hearing what the disciples are saying. There are many, this woman is there with her daughter and there's nothing she can do with her daughter. And the disciples say, let's chase this woman away. She's troubling you, master. Amen. And let's read then from there. And if you notice in verse 21, the region talk, talked about where some of the most dangerous demonic regions, Tyre and Sidon. One of the prophecies, I think, is either in Isaiah or Ezekiel relating to Lucifer connects to Tyre. That is, Lucifer has his root in one of these cities. That's where this woman came from. It means that his ancestors were worshippers of Lucifer. In the name of traditional gods. Praise the Lord. Then if you go down. Verse 24. He answered. Jesus answered. I was sent only to the Lordship of Israel. After Jesus spoke. First the, the, the disciples told this woman. Told Jesus. Let's chase this woman away. And Jesus gets up. Usually he will rebuke the disciples. But he didn't. He tells the woman, I did not come for you. I came for the Jews. You, the Canaanites, I didn't come for you. Can you imagine? Amen. At this point, if you were that woman, you would have carried your daughter and gone away. And left the Jews with their God. But listen to what happened. Women, take note. This is the, faith, the kind of faith that God wants to build in women. A faith that does not give up because God is on your side. Hallelujah. Listen. Now verse 25, the woman came and knelt down and worshipped. Listen. Read in other versions. I prefer King James there. It says, and behold, the woman, a Canaanite woman. No, let me go down. Verse 25. Then she came and worshipped him saying, Lord, help me. Please listen to why it is great faith. Because Christians, even of today, may not have this faith. Because they are easily unsettled and give, giving up on God. Listen. This woman comes from the, a terrible background, demonic background. Their culture is bad. She was supposed to, tie to that, be tied to that culture. She decides to cross over to Jesus. Jesus does not even listen to her. It is like a, someone is praying and God is saying nothing to the prayer. Amen. And then the devil tells you, just interpret like this, the devil tells you, stop praying. This God is not your God. Look for another means. And the woman resisted. She insisted in prayer. And when the matter became too strong, she switched to worship. Worshipping Jesus. A Jesus who is not from their background. Not his her uncle. Nothing. No family connection. When she heard the word, she knelt down and worshipped Jesus. To your surprise, brethren, look at something after she worshipped Jesus. Jesus was not moved by that worship. After she worshipped Jesus, hear Jesus' response after worship. Verse 26, and he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and give it to dogs. This is a woman who is on her knees and Jesus is speaking to her and she's in worship. Imagine you are worshiping God and the voice that comes to you is that what you are asking for, I can't give it to you because you're a dog. That is why this faith was a great faith. Amen. This this woman kneels down and worships Jesus and Jesus says, I cannot take what is meant for the children and give it to the dog. And history says that the Jews used to call non-Jews dogs at that time. Dog referring to people who cannot repent and stand. That is what he's saying. 
And he is, he is calling her dog, referring to her background, the Canaanite background. Check the history of the Bible. It's not that he's insulting the woman. He's just reminding the woman where you are coming from. Did you get that? And listen to the answer of the woman. The woman says, yes, Lord. Even the dogs can eat under the table when the children are eating on the table. Now, this is the problem. When preachers preach you to be too confident to becoming arrogant, self-confident to becoming arrogant, such that you think that you, all that God has to give you, you merit it, you must get it, and when you don't have it, you have a problem with God. You don't know that your faith has been destroyed. It is the humility of that woman that gave her this great faith. Listen to what she was confessing to Jesus. I am a dog. I know my background. I know where I'm coming from. In fact, calling me a dog meaning that I am alive. Dog is exhortation. Praise the Lord. Dog is exhorting me. I'm worse than that. I understand. But please, even when the people who matter are eating, those of us who are dogs can be creeping on the ground and something should at least fall so that we can pick and eat. Jesus was immediately moved. He could not contain his emotions. There. God was moved on the throne. That there's someone who ought to follow the devil but has switched to follow Christ to this extent. Even though it's in relation to something that he, she wants. But what is the lesson for the new covenant? Do not follow Christ like this because of materialism or anything concerning you. But have this great faith in relation to pressing to the kingdom. That is when Jesus said, I have not seen such a great faith. I can tell you that the faith of the woman was greater than the faith of the centurion. That was too much. Praise the Lord. Background. Obstacles. Then she switches to worship. Some of you come to church. When it's time to worship, you're looking up. And this woman had never, her background, her father knew no God. And she worshiped Jesus. And you, can you say that you've ever worshipped Jesus Christ? Yet you want something from God. Have you ever worshipped Jesus truly, truly from your heart? I can tell you for sure that there are some people sitting here who've never succeeded to worship Jesus. Because their hearts are so hardened. No humility. That is why this woman's faith was so great. What a great lesson that we can learn. Yet this great faith, as I tell you, is only a basic faith for Christians. Praise the Lord. No matter how great indeed it is. Because there are so many today who say they are Christians, but when preachers take them to the Old Testament, their faith becomes even lower than that of this woman. How do you know? They get self-righteousness and become to move around and talk big talks with nothing, no foundation, no humility. You see them first and you hear the big sounding words, but when you look at fruits, you see nothing. Praise the Lord. The question of Brother Charles, I'm going to skip many other things. Yes, sir. And uh, how to build faith. Brother yeah, Charles, ask the question. Yeah, yeah. You are yet to, there's still another question in that one. Now, my, uh, um, my major concern is that now, before I go to the other question, which is still in that one. Now, uh, will it be safe that, you know, when I look at this man, yeah. the, this woman and the centurion. Yes. Um, I just want to, like, raise this, that will it be safe if we say that maybe, part, uh, maybe partly one of the reasons why Jesus commended them for their faith was because they decided to stand in the gap. It was not really, though for this woman, it was for her daughter. Okay? But for the centurion, it was for his servant. It was not directly meant for them. You know, for us Christians nowadays, we are so self-centered. 
that everything has to do with us. I don't know whether if you get what I'm saying. I get it, but that is not the point. They had the Old Testament spirit, you could get it. They couldn't do this for, for somebody in the temple that they don't know. But you and I, I want to tell you this. Becoming a true believer, most of you are not yet. Because when you become a true believer, you get a completely different spirit. You are true brothers and sisters from your heart are those who are in Christ, not those you were born with. Not your siblings. That is a transformation that God does in the heart of a believer such that those who are in Christ are higher in rank and closer to you than your blood people. Then you say God did a work in your heart. And the truth is this. The people I'm closest to are here in this church. And apart from Brother Edgar, there's none of you that I'm related to. I'm very close to Brother Charles. We don't come from the same country. I only knew that there was anyone like Brother Charles in 2016. Ever existing in this world. But I'm so close to her. Now let me tell you this. When you look at the Old Testament, people believe God for something that has some direct or indirect connection to themselves. But in the New Testament, that spirit is so broken and completely wiped out that the people you are concerned about who become your brothers and sisters in the Lord have nothing to do in your family. So may, but it's only because of Christ if they become born again. If you don't have that spirit, forget. You are not yet born again. When you are born again, it means that you are born again into a new family where you recognize the members of that family as true brothers or sisters and you get concerned about them because you shall spend eternity together. In that respect, there's still some corruption there. All of them came for something that was related to them in one way or the other. If that servant dies, he was a faithful servant, he will not have a servant in the house. If that daughter dies, that was the woman's daughter. But in, in the New Testament, you begin to realize that people start to labor for people who are not connected to them in terms of bloodline. That is how godliness is. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So what I was saying is that, does these two have connection with faith for salvation? These two kind of faith, uh, faith that we've discussed now. In connection. Unfortunately, I prepared. That is what I was going to go to. Faith for salvation. There's also how to build faith. Romans chapter... You, you, you mentioned Acts 6, 8, Stephen full of faith. There is not something for us to read. Then how to build faith, Romans 10, 5 to 14, and Jude 20. We are not going to read. You can write it down if you have your uh, book. Romans 10, 5 to 14. When you read that, it tells you where faith comes from. Faith comes by hearing the words of Jesus Christ. Amen. The more you hear the word of God, the more you have faith. In that respect, Peter could not have faith to walk on water unless God has spoken. Jesus said, come. Then he had faith. Which means that the object of your faith is the word that God has spoken. So if faith, if you get the word of God and you open your heart, that same word provokes in you the ability to lean on God the more you hear that. Did you get that? That is how you get faith. Those of you who come to church and you hear the word of God, you go back, you throw it, you throw your Bible, you pick it again and dust it on Sunday to come back to church. You don't have faith. Praise the Lord. But those who meditate on the word of God all the time, their faith grows. Hallelujah. And now you can build your faith and then use your faith to build yourself. Jude verse 20. Jude is one chapter. You can write it down. We'll not read it. The Bible says, building our faith on our, building ourselves on our most holy faith and praying in the spirit. Did you get that? You build your faith by hearing the word. When you have faith by hearing the word, you then use the faith to build yourself in the Lord. 
Do you see the process? So if you don't have faith, you don't have the right word, you don't have the right faith. You don't have the right faith, you can never be anchored in Christ. That is why the only thing that the devil needs to do is to stop the preaching of the true word of God and misdirect the word of God just to cut off faith. And the moment he cuts off faith, he ends up cutting off every child of God from ever being built on Christ. That is the point. So I'd mentioned two passages there. Then uh, you ask if someone has a true faith, will that person still be saved? Amen. Just hold on with the question because this was quite important. Can you have the true faith and, and still lose, lose your salvation and not enter heaven? And still miss it? The answer is yes. Yeah, you say how? The answer is yes. Listen. Just as you can have much money and die of hunger because you lack the ability to take the money and buy food, so you can have faith and die of unrighteousness because you are unable to apply your faith to let the faith get the grace to let your life be godly. Did you get that? And you can also misdirect faith just like you can take money and buy useless things, you can also use faith for nonsense. And I want to let you know this. Some of these people who go around and say, I had faith and God gave me this, some are true. They will get those things, but they're getting the things that are not leading them to Christ and to heaven. And they will testify that God gave me this, God gave me that. And it will still have been by faith because they leaned on God to get something. But that thing was not leading them to salvation and to eternal life. Therefore, you can have even the true faith and go astray if you are not diligent. Faith is in the kingdom of God as many is in this world. Isaiah chapter 55 from verse 1. A thing, if you are patient, we should read it. Isaiah 55. Please, everyone should open, as long as you're, you're still in church, open your Bible. Are you in Isaiah 51, 55 verse 1? First he says, Come all you who are thirsty. Some of you are looking for Isaiah. It's around the middle of your Bible, please. But I prefer that when you come to church, come with a notebook. When I quote passages, write them down. When you go home, take a careful study around the passage. So that the Holy Spirit can speak to you further. Isaiah 55, verse 1. Come all you who are thirsty... Come to the waters. Do you know what the Holy Spirit is saying there? Jesus said, blessed are those who thirst and hunger after righteousness. Have you seen that? Because if you have the mentality of the New Testament, the moment you see a verse like this in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit immediately points you to what it means. Those who thirst, is not thirsting for the things of this world. Because the New Testament says you should thirst after righteousness. And therefore your faith produces righteousness. But if you thirst after other things, you will use faith for those things. And you will be wretched at the end. Because you will have misused faith. Hallelujah. Just as you misuse money, you can also misuse faith. Come and all you who are thirsty, come to the waters and you will have you who have no money, come buy and eat. Have you seen that? Come and buy even though you don't have money. But what are you using to buy? Faith. Hallelujah. Come buy wine and milk. What is wine? The Holy Spirit. Milk is, listen, the true word of God for children. Paul says that because you are babies, I cannot give you meat. I give you milk. You need milk. 
So what does, what, for you to, if you are thirsty after righteousness, what do you need? You need the Holy Spirit and the basic word of God, foundation. You don't need money. You don't have to give money to the man of God to get your blessings. You need faith. Do you see that in the New Old Testament? I'm using the New Testament spirit to interpret the Old Testament so that we can see what the spirit is saying. Hallelujah. Without money, with no cost. Verse 2, why spend your money on what is not bread? And your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good. And your soul will delight in the riches of fairs. Give ear and come to me. What is it again? Listen and give ear to God first. Before you are able to buy without money. Faith comes by hearing. Start by hearing what God is saying. And when you have faith, you use that faith to get the, the, the Holy Spirit and also to get the true word of God. More word. That is how faith then, Brother Charles, increases. Praise the Lord. You start with low faith by simply hearing what God is saying. And it develops faith in you and you lean on that God. And through that, you get the Holy Spirit. And from there, you get more of deeper revelations by the Holy Spirit, which is still coming by faith. And, you, and the more you get of the word of God, you grow now in faith also. Because faith comes by hearing, but the faith leads to more revelation, and the more revelation leads to more faith, and you keep growing. The first faith you received was because of the gospel. And after that, the more you hear, the more you grow. But the more you grow, the more you use your faith to get more of the revelation. Before God speaks to you, you must believe that he will speak. But when you got the first word to you, when God spoke to you through the one who came to preach the gospel to you, you had no belief at all. That were the first steps. That is how the first faith was developed in you. But from there, you started getting the deeper things of God. Praise the Lord. And that is how we grew up. And if we continue, we keep growing. And where is the destination? Perfection. So, if you don't follow this principle, even the small faith that you have, you can squander it. That is how many people, they get the right, right gospel. Give your life to Jesus Christ. They give their life to Jesus Christ. The next thing is you shall have money. You shall be great. Then he is using that small faith on wrong things. Soon the faith is gone. And there's no foundation he can stand on. He has no wine. He has no milk. No Holy Spirit. No deeper word of God. He cannot stand. He falls off. He backslides. He can enter heaven. Therefore you can have that true faith even in the beginning. But you lose it. Because you misused it. Do you see in what context then you can have the true faith and still not make it? Depending on what you did with the true faith. Because the only thing that brings salvation is if you use faith to get grace. And more of the word of God that becomes flesh in your life because of grace. Bringing you closer to Jesus, then you shall live with Christ. There, there were questions about Canaanites. Whether Canaan, the land of Canaan equals to receiving the Holy Spirit. The answer is no. Entering the promised land is equal to entering rest. Not receiving the Holy Spirit. You can receive the Holy Spirit, but if you do not have the, allow the Holy Spirit to deal with issues in your life, you still be worried and you never enter rest. So the promised land is equivalent to a state of rest as a Christian inside you, then you are in the Sabbath. And God said that they couldn't enter because they did not mix the gospel with faith. So it, it takes faith also to get to a state of peace which is the kingdom of God, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. My last question was about what Paul says about laboring uh, so that Christ may be formed in the believer. So the question was, what happens then when the believer is not receiving uh, anything? There's no sign that the, the, the believer is receiving. How do you deal with such a believer? Uh, Brother Eugene, we must never give up laboring for others, especially if we call them believers. Praise the Lord. Because usually things happen without us seeing with our naked eyes. Keep laboring and praying. 
if the person has any inclination towards Christ, something will be happening in their life. And that laboring is not only in prayer, it's laboring and giving the word. That is why when I give you the word, I keep preaching and I get tired and keep preaching and I get tired and I look at you, whatever you get up to do, surprise me, I still don't give up on you. Amen. Because I know that the one who is working in the background is not working by sight. Amen. So I'm not, I'm not going to give up on you. Even after I preach, if you go back, let me see you holding a boyfriend's hand. I'll come and hit your hand. You leave the boyfriend. I'll still bring you to church and keep preaching to you until we all enter heaven together in Jesus' name. I will not reject you as my sister. I will not reject you as my brother. But if you leave, there's nothing I can do. Praise the Lord. So in that respect then, there's no way somebody has an inclination towards God that you labor for that person and the person remains the same. I just wanted to ask a question about why Satan always picks people as, as his victims. Okay, can I hear clearly? Anybody who was close back and hears the question can interpret it. Why does Satan pick some people as his victim? Great question. Because the Bible says that the devil is running around like a roaring lion seeking for whom to devour. What are the kind of people Satan gets to devour? Listen. Those who are not in Christ. There are many who come to church but are not in Christ. Praise the Lord. Because when you are in Christ, Satan cannot come into Christ. He may come in church but not in Christ. Amen. So he cannot devour you in Christ. And that's what I said in the beginning. That if you are in Christ, your time of birth, life and everything, to the time and way of death is determined by God. Even if it looks as if the devil had a hand in your death, God did it. He allowed it. So if you are someone who comes in Christ and moves out and does your own things, and next time you come again in Christ, one day when you are out on your way, Satan catches you there. He deals with you. If he doesn't devour you, you come back with something missing. So the answer is, remain in Christ, and Satan will remain away from you. Satan will be outside Christ, trying to influence you, doing all kinds of gimmicks, but you will not be moved. Praise the Lord. That's a simple answer to that, but that question alone is a long series of teaching. Next question. Thank you. Uh, my question is on faith, wisdom, and knowledge. Are we required to balance the three or the two, faith and wisdom? And uh, I'm asking this uh, based on what we also learn in, in, in Luke and in response to some of the brother Charles' questions. That yes. Jesus himself had wisdom which he got from the teachers as well. And yes. he also asked us to have that wisdom. So mm. now we have people uh, in the boot which had wisdom and they had knowledge. They yeah. saw that the, the, the boot was likely to sink because of the storm and the wind. And they walked Jesus Christ. And when he, they walked Jesus, he said they have little faith. So I want to know if we are required to balance these two, wisdom and faith, as we take decisions in life, or we should just have faith and do less with our wisdom and knowledge. Thank you. Faith is what you need to get wisdom. Faith is what you need to get knowledge. That is the kind of wisdom and knowledge we're talking about is godly knowledge. Because there's a wisdom of this world which you don't need faith for. And there's also a knowledge of the things of this world. You don't need, you don't need faith to know chemistry. Amen. You don't need faith to know how to bake bread. They are all common wisdom of this world. But when it comes to the knowledge of the things above... You need faith. So the beginning itself is faith, and faith comes by hearing. And when you get faith, you use faith to get, to get more hearing. Because by faith you get revelation, and that is the knowledge. And wisdom is the ability to use knowledge for practical purpose. That is, if someone were to ask you, how is this your godliness practical in your life? They're asking you a wisdom question. Because of my godliness, because of my faith in Christ, I'm able to know how to deal with Brother Temba so that he can grow with me together without us clashing. 
I'm able to relate to Brother Temba in a righteous way. If I did not have that knowledge and wisdom, I might have trampled on Brother Temba or squeezed Brother Temba or used Brother Temba for self-gain. That would be unrighteousness. So you see, the beginning of all things is faith. That's what the Bible says. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Even the wisdom and knowledge itself, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, is a gift. The gift of the Holy Spirit that comes by faith. Amen. So seek faith and a true kind of faith. However, if you have faith without wisdom, when you have faith, the first thing to use faith to get is wisdom and knowledge. Just as if you go to the market not knowing what to buy, you use your money to buy funny things and you come home, you regret. So too, if you don't have knowledge, you will not know how to use your faith to get more of Christ. That is why if you have faith, you need to also get more of the word of God so that you apply the faith in the word of God and then you get Christ. Hebrew chapter 4 said, the same word that is preached to us, it was also preached to them in the wilderness, but they heard it and did not mix it with faith. And therefore they did not get the fruits of that word. But you got the word, you mix it with faith, and you see results of godliness in your own life. So faith first, then the word but when the word comes, you need faith to apply to the word. Praise the Lord. It's like marketplace. If you have money and you don't have knowledge, you misuse the money. If you have faith, you don't have godly knowledge, you misuse the faith. Praise the Lord. Um, please, I want to find out something from you, man of God. Um, you see, when we talk of this faith, what I really want to know is that is it only God who controls this faith or Satan does too? Because you see, there are people who really have, there are people who have faith more than even us who call ourselves Christians, uh, children of God, let me say so. So I don't know if Satan too controls this aspect of faith or only God has the power to do that. Please listen to faith first before you ask yourself whether Satan controls it. Faith of God is you leaning on God, number one. But you can lean on God for something that is not godly. Which then you are using God to do something against God. So you can have faith in God to give you something that is not godly. For example, having faith in God to give you worldly things is an example. Because God wants you to lean on him. To let, you give you, to let him give you his will. But if you lean on him to have your own will or the will of someone else by trusting God, you are using God in a dangerous way. It's like me coming to use you to get what I want. But God wants that if you are God, I come to you, you will want me to use your power to do the things that you want me to do. Mankind who says, Christians who say they have faith, they go to God. They ask God, Lord, help me to do this thing I want to do, my will. They don't even care what is it that God wants me to do. In doing so, they use God's power and God's ways to glorify the devil. That's the first way. The second way, which is now increasingly present in church, is that people, so-called men of God, entirely depend on the devil. By receiving secret powers from the devil and depending on the devil. But hourly you think these are men of God. But their faith is on the devil's ability to help them make people fall. And help them make miracles. Which the Bible warns us of in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. That in the last days it will happen. So you see, the devil through your own ego and lack of submission to God can misuse the faith of God in you to take glory. And the devil can also give you his own faith. During the series on faith, we looked at demonic faith. And it's very important, brother, you're asking this question, but if you listen to all the series on faith, which is in our website, please, those of you who are close to brother, forward the link to him. You will see the link. Audio messages are in the website. You listen to them. The question that you've asked means that if I have to completely answer you, I have to start the series of faith all over again with you. But this is the little I can answer you. Yes, the devil controls that faith. It will give him room to control it. 
So we'll be taking the glory of God and giving to Satan. Um, my question is based on understanding the difference between righteousness under the law and righteousness by faith. Yes. Okay, I'm going to give a scenario mm -hmm. that, so that, yeah, for better understanding. Nah. Okay, back then, the Jews would go to the synagogues, yeah. right, on the Sabbath. Mm. And apart from the ceremonial law, if you were to look at the moral law, which is the Ten Commandments, and yeah. Let's say the rabbi would be teaching on one of the Ten Commandments. Let's say, do not... Do not murder. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, do not murder. Then the Jew, the faithful Jew who went to the synagogue on the Sabbath, listens to the message, right, mm -hmm. at the synagogue. And according to what Christ is saying, that the temple is actually a place of prayer, mm -hmm. the Jews also still went there to pray, right? They prayed, yeah. They yes. listened, they pray. Yes. Yeah. So they would go also to the temple. The Jew would also go to the temple and pray. Mm -hmm. Asking God for to give him the okay, yeah, to give him the grace, not the grace, to give him help or whatever, help. so that help he yes, has not to murder. Mm -hmm. ne? Then he goes out, then he finds a person that he considers maybe his enemy or someone who crossed him. Mm -hmm. Then he is tempted to murder this person. But then he remembers the message that he heard in the synagogue, that do not murder, do not murder. Then he goes away angry, angrily. He leaves the presence of that person. He goes home so that he does not murder this person, but he's still angry at heart, mm. right? So that's the, that's the case of the Jew. Then there's a Christian who goes... Now we understand in the interest of time, you can see the Christian does similar thing also. Yes. He prays, he hears the word of God, he prays. Now, the difference is that in the, Holy, in the Christian, there's a Holy Spirit. In the Jew, there's no Holy Spirit. That's the first difference. The Holy Spirit is not inside him. Yes. Number one. Number two is that the Jew is counting on his ability to resist not murdering this person. Because there's no Holy Spirit in him to help him not to do it. Now, listen. The main essence of the righteousness of the law is that it depended on some external ceremonies. That those ceremonies were the central piece in addition to the word they heard. So they would take pride in the fact that they have done A, B, C. They wash their legs before coming. They wash their hands before eating and all of that. These were all external. And also their righteousness was also external in terms of the fact that when they talk about murder, the hatred will be inwardly. He will be grinding his teeth concerning his enemy, but he, he will only not want to kill his enemy, but often he will kill his enemy. Because quite often, even with the law, they will set up people and kill them. Because they couldn't control, although they struggled to. So you see, as I said, although they struggled to, it was a righteousness that was based on their own works, although God spoke. The set of requirements that were put there, there was no provision that God would do it for you. You do it. And anyone who follows it, who does these things, will live by them. That's one of the verses that refers to the Old Testament. But the New Testament, you don't live by the, the things that you do. You live by simply leaning on Christ. If, if there is anything that you will be blamed for as a Christian, is that when Jesus wanted to pull your leg so that you take a step this direction, you resisted and pulled it behind. Then you'll be blamed for it. But the Jews did not have that ability for God to lead them in that way. It were done. There will be an external prophet and a priest leading them like that. Hence the verse that says, they that are led by the Holy Spirit, that the children of God is the key difference. Amen. So the righteousness that comes by faith, as I said, is righteousness is the right way of doing things. The righteousness of man is the right way of doing things by the ability of man and by the judgment of man. But the righteousness of God is God's own way of doing things by the ability of God and by the judgment of God. That's a very high righteousness. Now the Jews think they have achieved righteousness by struggling not to do these things and doing these other things. But when God looks at it, he sees his stain with motives that is within them.
completely tainted and spoiled. And God cannot accept it as righteousness, although man will clap for it. Praise the Lord. But you as a Christian, you lean on God, and God starts to produce that inward clean heart inside you, so that whatever you do by the power of God is perfect. But you grow into that perfection. You inherit the perfection, and you grow into it so that your life becomes Christ-like. That is a key difference. And it's not as easy as we can explain. But there's a thing called the righteousness of God, which Christ brought for us, which comes by grace through faith. And there's another thing called the righteousness of the law, which is by the effort of man, which comes by Moses and people doing some external rituals to accomplish them. I want to be clear with this when, um, about the Lord's Prayer. Mm-hmm. Um, the Bible teaches Matthew chapter 6, right? Matthew 6, yes. Yeah, it teaches us to pray like this. Yes. So why don't we continually pray that way, but we pray other ways, and then aside that, are we supposed to pray that before a normal prayer, or you pray that after your prayer? Sister, there's a series also in our website called Prayer, which when you go to your website, you'll find it. It's one of the series I gave first. Listen, there's no other prayer but that prayer. And every prayer we pray in church must be contained in that prayer, otherwise it's not biblical prayer. So that prayer is a framework. Anything you want to pray, does it fit into that framework? It doesn't mean that all the time when you get up to pray, you must pray only that prayer from beginning to the end. But you must make sure that your prayer fits into what that framework that Jesus gave. First, God must be your father. You don't need to get up to say our father word in heaven all the time, but you need to have faith in God as a father. Amen. But normally when you get up to pray, you say my father, you start to talk right. Or our father, you start to talk right. And you may say anything, but your faith is in God as a father. Father who art in heaven means two things. The one thing is that father means a loving person who cares for you. Who art in heaven means two things. He is all powerful ruling from heaven. He is the highest. And secondly, he is in heaven and is able to detect everything everywhere. That is what I told you. So our father who art in heaven is about faith. That's how the prayer begins. The prayer starts with you having the right faith first before you even continue. That's what the first part of the prayer means. Then second is hallowed be thy name. That is why any of you who come to pray and the prayer is to hallow your own name. And a prophet comes and tells you you shall be great. I tell you straight, that prophet is deceiving you. You shall not be great in any way in Jesus' name. It's the name of Jesus who shall be great, not yours. Hallelujah. That's the second part of the prayer. Do you see that? So if anybody gets up here and says, let's pray that this brother will be a great brother, I say, shut up. It is not what Jesus taught us to pray. Amen. But if someone is praying, no matter what kind of prayer is praying, if their purpose is to magnify the name of Jesus, it's within that prayer. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Not my kingdom. It is not about my family background and my kingdom where I stay so that I will be great and dominating people. It is about God ruling over me and over others. It, it, all prayer must fit that. Thy kingdom come, thy will, the will of God, not our will. Did you see what I said about your will? That you use faith, you use God's power to do your will. It contradicts that play, prayer. The prayer says, thy will be done. Amen. On earth as it is in heaven. But most believers are praying for their own will. Lord, do this for me. I want to, I will to do this. Lord, help me do it. That is opposite of that prayer that she is talking about. And do you know there are many believers who pray like this? They go and look for prophets to pray for, to pray so that God will do their will. But God wants you to do his will. That will be done on us as it is in heaven. Then only after that, when you have prayed all of this about God, then you say, give us this day our daily bread. That is where your own need comes in. What are you saying? Give me daily bread so that I can magnify your name, bring your kingdom, and do your will. For me to do your will, I need, your, I need daily bread. 
and also forgive my sins. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. That's all about the prayer. Which then means that whenever we are praying in church, listen, if we contradict any element of that prayer, alert us and we will repent. Amen. Praise the Lord.